Good afternoon, everyone. How are you all doing? Good. Good. How many people were here at the first workshop we had on the 26th of September? Okay. For those people that weren't there at the first workshop, we did make a DVD recording of it, and we're doing the same thing of this workshop today. And it's sort of an unedited version. It's just a straight run of three, three hours of presentations. And so I've got copies with me. If you'd like a copy, catch up with me sometime during a break, and I'll give you a copy. And then the actual PowerPoints that were presented are on a website that Leslie Sturmer hosts. And you can find that very easily by putting in Florida Shellfish Aquaculture. And at hers is about the first website that shows up. But it's a universe. Before, before yours. Before mine. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so it's a University of Florida Institute of Food and Agricultural Sciences website. So you'll notice it because it's a university website rather than a commercial site. Welcome to the second workshop. This is going to be a little more in-depth about gear and seed. We've invited every manufacturer of gear that we know of, all the seed producers to come. So there'll be presentations, hopefully fairly short, and then discussions so that you can ask your questions and then plenty of breaks so that you can get one-on-one -on -one with whoever interests you. And then you may notice in the courtyard there is some gear there as well to look at, pick up, ask questions of. Those people that could not attend send us printed material and that's on that little thin table against the back wall. So help yourself to that print material. If you haven't already, we have a sign-in sheet. We would like you to sign in, provide your contact information. And what I'll do this time is if you put us, give your name and a clear address, write it clearly, we will just mail you a DVD of the workshop from today. You don't have to ask for it, it'll just come in the mail. We also have an evaluation form back there that we want feedback on these workshops. What questions weren't answered is one real t big topic for us, but how well did we do? You know, was it the information that you needed provided? So give us that feedback. Here's your opportunity to be critical. You know, just please fill those out. You don't have to put your name and address on there, just do that. Um, <clears throat> restrooms are all the way to the back through the second room and to the right. And was there anything else? Oh, I was. Uh, cell phones. And then uh, the last time I talked about the private aids to navigation. Because this gear is all, all surface running gear, you're now a navigational ha hazard. And you have to mark that hazard with a very specific set of marks that are required by the Coast Guard, and you have to use Coast Guard approved equipment. When I talked about it then, the Coast Guard was really reluctant to say this is how you should do it in every instance. Well, we've sort of inched along with that since September, and this is the seventh district out, in, out of New Orleans. They do a lot of oil and gas work, so when I talk to them, they have to really switch gears and think, think differently. It appears that they're going to be much more comfortable with this kind of a setup. It's a yellow triangle on the typical wooden piling like you see navigational markers used on and then with a light on top that blinks with a yellow flash and this is the particular unit that we bought and it has that out in Alligator Harbor so it's a two and a half second delay and then a point three second flash and it's a one candela light so it's going to have to be both a sign and a light to mark an op a navigational hazard and you just can't put these up you have to get a a permit from the Coast Guard to do this, identify where your lease is going to be, where this gear is going to be, and then they will notify National Ocean Service to change all the navigation charts that will show a navigational hazard, and they will also put out a notice to mariners that there's a navigational hazard now present in that area. And this is, does several things. One, it's like rules of the road. Once you're on the map, once the mariner's been notified, once you have this gear in the water, the private aid's navigation, this should reduce or eliminate your liability because you are now complying with the law of the land that you've appropriately marked that hazard. And the people should run in there and, and cause damage to your gear or to themselves. You know, they've essentially broken law because they haven't paid attention to the rules of the road as a, as a mariner, as a boating public. So this is pretty important to do. We've run through the permitting application with the Coast Guard already with the 7th District. They're very helpful people, and I'll be glad to work with anybody on doing an application for individual locations. 
so far it appears that that is a prescription. That's what they're going to require. It may vary a little bit. We'll see. You know, every, they, they've been very cautious to tell me that every location is different, so there may be some slight differences you know, between sites, but that seems to be where they're going. And um, I think that's... Quick question, is that one per corner? It's going to, this, that's a good question. So it, it depends on the distance between corners. And I've had this discussion with the Coast Guard. It sort of depends on where you are, again, how much boating traffic is out there, what kind of traffic is out there, and the distance between those corners. And they, they are leaning towards a, the sites that I've shown them and talked to them about have been very out-of-the-way locations, so typical of Alligator Harbor or Oyster Bay that people have been talking about. Having uh, PVC pipes in between that have a four-inch retro-reflective tape on there that's yellow. So this distance between corners is kind of critical, and the, the representative was a little cagey, you know, how far can these bigger marks be apart, you know, where you may not have to suddenly put another one in the middle. And so I'll have to work with you on that and work with the, with the Coast Guard and find out how many marks in total. Hopefully it can be just four corners. Now if you're, if you're familiar with the Alligator Harbor Aquaculture Use Zone, there's 14 marks out there, seven on one side and seven on the other. And those are spaced pretty far apart. I thought that was pretty generous of them. It was way more generous than when we first started talking. How far apart? And I don't know how far apart they are. We've been just out there on the water putting them up, so sorry. But I can find out, Leslie. Okay. Leslie, did you want to say a few words? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I'm Leslie Sturman. I'm with the Shellfish Extension Program at the University of Florida. So this is a series of workshops. Um, we all met here sometime in September, and the intent is to bring information to the increasing interest of oyster aquaculture in the area. And our first intent was to bring in folks that had been working in intensive oyster culture efforts along the Gulf of Mexico that would share the same set of criteria or constraints or prospects that folks here in the panhandle would be facing as well, whether it's environmental concerns or marketing opportunities or challenges for intensive oyster cultivation. And if you recall, in September, we had Bill Walton from Auburn University, Shellfish Lab, did a very nice job in an introductory kind of setting and shared with you his experiences there um, in the coastal waters of Alabama looking at some of these gear types. Uh, I'm jumping around here, but since I mentioned Bill, we brought Bill back, and we have broken up the program today kind of into three categories, and they don't necessarily follow it by hour, because we've got a lot to do. So but first, we're going to start off with a presentation. We did Alabama um, in September. Now we're moving to Louisiana to share some of those experiences with you. And John Supan is with Louisiana State University and, and Sea Grant. John's been working with the oyster industry there in that state for 20 years plus, oh my gosh, 30 years. Um, he runs the Grand Isle Oyster Hatchery as well, so he has a lot of experiences to share with you today. And we will follow that presentation with Tom Rossi from Four Seas Breeding Technology. We're going to take a break so we can stretch. There's coffee back there, there's some drinks, cookies. But this isn't going to be these prolonged breaks because we have to move on. But it gives us an opportunity to move from here out to the open area in here. And that's where Bill Walton is going to lead in a discussion and review some of the considerations in these various gear types. And strictly from um, a focus on the gear type, from considerations on advantages and disadvantages basing on the site, what some of the site considerations are. Uh, risk management considerations, deployment, etc. It's not going to focus at all on the brand type. For that, actually, we have several equipment suppliers that are joining us today all the way from Canada, where they're telling me it's already, already have ice on the water. So that will be the third component of today's um, program. So we'll go out in the courtyard here. And we want to make sure that all your questions are answered and there's enough discussion and dialogue. But we're going to stop at some point in time, come back in here, because we have, as I mentioned, folks traveling from several locations to talk about their gear, their equipment, as well as we have some seed suppliers in the room, too. I will be the timekeeper, so um, let's start with John Supan. 
We've been farming oysters in Louisiana for over 100 years, but it's been on bottom, leases. We have some 392,000 acres under lease in Louisiana, uh, some 1,200 or more vessels uh, operating on those leases and on the public grounds. But where I'll show you here is that um, this is what our industry looks like, what we call the lugger. 60 foot, 40 to 60 foot vessels, all designed to haul seed oysters from the public grounds. And, and these are water cannons. These are what I call a seed boards. And they'll, they'll use oyster dredges to go out on the public grounds, dredge up the seed, and transplant it to their leases and hose it all overboard with these water cannons. High volume production. This is uh, to show you a graph, this is from 1961 to 2012, and the black is the production from the private leases, and the white is from the public grounds, and that shows you how important oyster production off private leases is, is in Louisiana. And we generally, we lead the nation in oyster production state by state. So private production is extremely important to Louisiana. And typically, that is all maintained by culch plants, either by the state, but recently, since Hurricane Katrina, a great deal of that has occurred privately, where they bought their own culch and hired contractors or loaded up their oyster vessels and planted their own culch to catch wild spat. And this is the state of the, state of the things here, and this is in 2013. This is uh, what we sack oysters is just market size oysters. We sell them by burlap sacks. And, um, this is um, sack oysters is the line, seed oysters is the bars, and you can see how cyclical it is. And it has a lot to do with how much fresh water we're getting down the Mississippi River. And those, anybody from Apalachicola is suffering from that right now. And right here is when we started up our hatchery in 1990. And here we are today in about the same situation. And there just isn't any seed available on the public grounds right now. So uh, that, that production you saw earlier in, in the earlier years is all coming from private leases. Now, uh, our hatchery started during that time in 1990 when, it, uh, when, we were, when we were lacking seed on the public grounds. And it originally started out as a commercial hatchery. And then when we had a historic rainfall in 91, by 92, all the wild seeds started coming back. And by 93, they had to go out of business because nobody cared about a hatchery. So that's when we, they loaned all the equipment to us and we took it over as, a, as, a, as an R&D place. Uh, but, but what we're using it for is to both, we have the capability of both commercial scale production. The hatchery is designed to produce a billion larvae a season, April, uh, April through October. And we also use it for technology transfer. It's a state-of-the-art facility thanks to FEMA because I got a good bit of money after Hurricane Katrina or Hurricane uh, Gustav to, uh, to uh, upgrade our systems. Uh, so we can, we, can go to, we can crack out lots of larvae if we have to. The vast majority of that goes to the state of Louisiana to help replenish the public grounds. Uh, but we're also, we've been focusing over the years on breeding program. Um, and I'll get into that later to help improve meat yield and survival. We also have an R&D farm at Grand Isle where we have the Australian longline system deployed there and we also have the oyster grow floating cage system deployed there. As show and tell, uh, Bill Walton will be going over those later, but also to raise our research broods. Um, because again, we we uh, we focused our niche in the Gulf is is focus on 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 having a breeding program and having select brood stocks for use by other hatcheries and other growers. Uh, our focus is also remote setting. Back in the early, late 80s, we focused on we followed the the model coming out of the Pacific Northwest, where hatcheries were not vertically integrated all the way to market size. They produced lots of larvae, billions of larvae, and sold them to growers who growers would, would receive. The, these are oyster larvae that are magnified 100 times. And you can collect these things when they're ready to set and put them in a wet handkerchief or a wet uh, uh, coffee filter, ship them across the world. So you can stick these things in a wrap them up in paper towel and keep it moist, put them in a the refrigerator for days. Take them out of the refrigerator, ship them somewhere, let them warm up, pour it in a bucket, and then pour that in your tank, and they will spat on whatever you got in that tank. It's called remote setting. And what the value of this is that, div that division of labor allows hatcheries to be successful, and it also allows growers to be successful so that every grower doesn't have to have his own little hatchery. 
You can just, the idea is get on telephone and call and order it. And that's, that was our focus in Louisiana back in the 80s, and it still is today. We're also, with remote setting, we're focusing on two things, uh, individual or single seed production, and also spat on shell. We have shucking houses in Louisiana, and they see the value of, of, of making their own spat on shell. And so in this particular case, this guy has taken in a, a shrimp boat, took all the shrimp rigging off, put on some very cheap and expensive totes or tanks and he's bagging up shell inexpensively and being able to uh, being able to pour larvae in these tanks and make spat on shell and playing it on his leases uh, and this is what you which is what you're after okay so um, in 2012 we joined Louisiana joined nine other states that now allows the use of the water column and water surface over, over existing oyster leases. And with some 400,000 acres under lease, that can be significant. Um, Act 293 allows what we now call alternative oyster culture, AOC, and it again allows the column, water column and surface. But what the state has done it, through the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries has created what's called a suitability map. We went through a marine spatial planning exercise to where we designated areas where you can do this and where you cannot do that, irregardless of whether you have a bottom lease or not. So when an oysterman wants to try uh, alternative oyster culture on his oyster lease, the first thing I have him do is ha take go see Wildlife and Fisheries with your lease number and, and find out if it falls in, in, in inside or outside that map. If it's outside that map, then he can go ahead and apply for his individual permits. He applies for his uh, coastal use permit and his core permit all through uh, uh, the Louisiana Department of Natural Resources after he, he gets, or she, I'm not gender biased, uh, after he gets that, that uh, permit from, that, from them, then he applies for an alternative oyster culture permit from the Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. And in the, in the, uh, we have two of those permits in the hopper right now. One's a little closer to fruition than the other, and, and I'm assisting them with their permit applications. Um, also, Act 583 established the Grand Isle Oyster Farming Zone with the Grand Isle Port Commission as the authority there. And it is um, an area where oystermen, where the permitting, pro the permitting process is complete and the individual farmers going into that zone don't have to wait and get their individual permits. It's all set up already. Uh, site selection is very, very, very important. In my opinion, the site dictates the type of gear you're going to use. Okay. And that's the bottom line there. And that all has to do with cylinder regime, bottom type, water depth, and fetch. Exposure, the fetch, is very, very important. Um, and the reason why is because what Bill and I are going to recommend, and anyone with, with any smarts is going to recommend, that you want to use air drying to control fouling. What we've learned over the years in Louisiana, certainly, and, and all over the world is learning this, that biofouling drives up your labor costs. You've got to keep it clean. Because if you can't, then the water can't flow to the oysters. There's less food get, getting to them. They don't grow as fast. They'll stunt, or they can even smother and die. So you got to keep your gear clean. And if you got to pick that up and pressure wash it on a, on a monthly basis, your labor skyrockets. You're going to need too much for your oysters, and it's not going to work. Plain and simple. You've got to be able to air dry on command. And so you want to focus on systems, whether you take something off the shelf that's commercially available or whether you're going to design something totally new, you have to have the ability to air dry on command. All right, that, that is it. And so, but the fetch is important because if you're going to flip something over and let it float on the surface overnight to dry, you've got to be concerned about wave action. So the site selection there is going to be important as well. Um, we are focusing on two pieces of gear for our alternative oyster culture, the oyster grow system or a floating cage, and, um, and also low pro. Now low pro is, is, is gear that sits on the bottom and it doesn't have that ability to air dry, but you can still get fast growth on it and some of our Louisiana oystermen are looking at this particularly because it's on the bottom and they have bottom leases. Um, uh, this is the Grand Isle Oyster Farming Zone, it's a 25 acre zone and these are all um, squares right here. Where's the button? These are these are all two-acre plots. 
with a 40 foot navigation lanes built in and the Grand Isle Oyster Commission is the authority where you go and get a permit to, to have a two acre plot assigned to you. And then we at Sea Grant does the training and, and all that. So uh, we're also focusing on starting up new businesses, nursery businesses. We do not at the hatchery, we don't wanna be in a seed business. We got, we got larval production down, okay? But we don't wanna get into the seed business and our goal is to start new businesses up. So we're, we're teaching oystermen, if they have waterfront property and the bulk and, and the, uh, and the, and the bulkheads and pilings along the water's edge have oysters on it, and you got electricity, that's a good nursery site. And you can build these nurseries out of used 55 gallon plastic drums. This system here will produce 500,000 seed, and it only costs $4,000. So it's real, real simple. And his seed been in there too long, but that's, that's, that what, <laughs> that's what it looks like, okay? He started making a seed before his cages came in, and, they, and his cages were late. Okay, but if you got green water, here, let me tell you what you're looking for. You fill up a 55 gallon drum with water and let it water flow through it. You stick your hand in it when it's empty, up to your elbow. And if you can't see your fingers because it's so green, you got a good sight. And if it's like that, if your water quality is like that, the seed in that drum will double their volume every week. They explode. I mean, they just grow like crazy if you got that kind of water quality. So that's the kind of site you're looking for if you want to be in a nursery business. Can you go back to the other picture? The site was just walking. Let me see that. That one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very, very simple. And there's a company in New Orleans where we're looking at. Well, the problem with these is, is we're getting these uh, drums from um, Snow Wizard in New Orleans. That's the company that, that invented snowballs machines. And these drums, they're, they're bringing in the, the, uh, the flavors, uh, the, the base stuff, uh, propylene glycol or something like that. Uh, it's a food grade stuff. And they add, the, they add the flavors to it after it gets there. So they're getting drums and drums of this propylene glycol stuff. And they're selling the used plastic food grade drums out the back door for 10 bucks a piece. And we're taking a whole saw and a jigsaw to these things and turn them into uh, nursery silos. So what does the seed taste like? Vanilla. Well, whatever flavor your your whatever whatever snowball flavors you're you're partial to, I'm sure. But um, so so all you need is a source of cheap drums. I don't recommend you get stuff that has petroleum products in it. You know, even though you could wash it out, but you know, um, you got to think like an oyster. So the time when you're looking at that, there's a, you can see the input looks from a pump that's on the dock. Yeah, we got it raised up here. It's sitting on a little platform. That's a two, five horsepower pump. So that if you get a little tropical event, but it's it's west of you, but pushes some water in, maybe makes in deep water there, you just keep going. You know, right here's his right here's his uh, motor motor uh, uh, motor switch. Um, and, and right over here, well, he since has got another power pole in here for his service disconnect, but that's all chest high. So that if you do have a little tropical event, there have been years I've had a system operating like this, and 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 we yeah. So her or tropical storm Alicia went into Houston one year, and in our nursery, the water level on our nursery at that time was like right here at high tide for those two days, and at low tide it was it was it was the water was gone, but for a couple days there they, our area got flooded it didn't matter as long as my pump and electrical was out of the water we still operated and what Jules has done is very simple okay so this is this area right here the Grand Isle Port Commission owns and he leased him out a little spot to set up a nursery because Jules didn't own waterfront property and what Jules did is had his 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 uh, father-in-law is, is in the backhoe business and they came and dug a little trench lined it with some black plastic and that's his return it's just a ditch that they made to run back into the bay. It's very, very simple. Okay, so the water flows in through the... Uh, the water's the coming water. in right here, and it comes in this manifold, and it's, it's, it's sewer line. Four inch, flow on it. It's four-inch sewer line pipe. It fills up top. And it comes in here, and each has a valve, and it upwells through the seed mass, and right here is you yeah, see yeah, some water coming out. Just a single. Uh, very simple. And what's beautiful about this is when you cut this up, what's the top of the drum becomes the bottom of the silo base. And then you flip this upside down and you, and, and I've built a, I don't have any pictures, I should have put them in there. Um, I've made a circular piece of plywood with, with four um, triangles in it that makes a one inch by one inch um, 
support grid there and you lay that on top of that drum and you draw out your four triangles with with a sharpie and then you drill a pilot hole and you cut them out and and then you line the inside with plastic mesh you take another inch of plastic off the drum to make a retaining ring for it and you use some stainless steel screws to hold that in and then you cut out the handles you drill in a hole for your discharge and this nests right inside the thing because it's got a curved bottom and it, it works so simply well. The problem is, is after two summers, these white, these white silos uh, deteriorate under the sun because they're not UV treated. Now, there's a company in New Orleans who's looking at having kits made out of black, um, black plastic to where this will all be pre-made. You won't have to go get drums and cut them up yourself. You can give this guy a call and just buy a nursery kit and it'll come with the drums it'll, with the screen already in it and the plumbing and everything all you, and the pump and all you got to do is take it home and put it together. We're getting to that point with this. So. But, uh, John, you might mention you've got the video that shows how to build this. Is yeah, yeah, I do. I, I, I'm hip. I, I, I forgot, but yeah, it's on YouTube. You can go to our hatchery website and, and see it. Yeah. Do you shade them or the sun is important to the hat? No, no, you don't. The only reason he has a tent up here is just so he can work under it. Right, I meant to It can be outdoors. damage to the, the drums to prevent it. Could you shade them? Yeah, she said if you, you, you could, Sure you could shade them. Sure you could shade them. Mm -hmm. If you want to. But our goal is to where it's all made out of UV treated plastic and you don't have to worry about shading. Well, what about torrential rains, for example? It's sitting open there and you get heavy. No big storms. deal. No big deal. Because you, you, got, you got water flowing through this constantly, so the rain isn't going to do much. Unless, unless you have so much rain or so much riverine input that it drops your salinity in the bay. But, but by the time they're seed, they're a lot more hardier than they are as larvae when it comes to salinity changes. Uh, big seed again. Uh, so what's happened now is he's taken the 60-foot lugger and it stays tied up most of the time. And now he's using a small skiff. He's dramatically reduced his fuel costs and his oyster farming efforts to where he's using his big lugger just to haul around cages. And then he only takes that out maybe once or twice a year. And the rest of the time he serves his farm with a little skiff and a davit on it. Okay. And our other focus I mentioned is breeding. On the left you have triploids uh, and on your left you have diploids and you can see the meat difference. Okay, everything alive on this earth except for some strange bacteria and viruses have a set of chromosomes from the mother and a set of chromosomes from the father just like all of us here in this room, the trees, the grass, whatever. Um, but at the hatchery what we're able to do is breed an oyster that has three sets of chromosomes. Two sets means diploid. D-I, die means two. Tri means three, like tricycle has three wheels. Triploids have three sets of chromosomes. And what happens is that makes them sexually sterile. They can't reproduce. So they get fat in the wintertime like all oysters do, but come spring and summer when the water temperatures increase, diploids spawn and, they're, and they burn off all their winter fat through spawning and their meat starts looking watery and some guys call them water bladders or whatever. Triploids can't spawn, so they stay fat all summer long. And that's what you want to grow in these cages. Because you're going to incur an additional cost to this off bottom culture. What you want to do is have a product no one else has. Okay, and this is it right here. So, and they also grow faster than diploids too. So, um, so, but to do that, a hatchery has to have tetraploid broodstock, and that's what we have done through my colleagues at LSU and collaborators at, at other places, and Tom Rossi with Four Seas Breeding Technologies. We have developed a tetraploid broodstock line for the Gulf of Mexico, and we have them at our hatchery, and they're available. We can, we can ship sperm to other hatcheries and let them make triploids, and all they'll do is just rinse the sperm out of these little vials and expose it to their eggs from their female broodstock and make triploids. And what we're doing is we're just following what agriculture did decades ago with, with bull sperm. You know, you don't take the bull to the barn anymore. Okay? The rancher has his veterinarian call up a company and frozen sperm show up and they thaw them out and rinse them out of these straws and then the veterinarian puts on a glove up to his armpit, puts, sucks it up in a shrins and he shoves it into the cow and inseminates her. And that's what they've been doing now for a couple of decades. And so, um, but this you won't have to use 
rubber gloves. <laughs> okay, so, um, and we've also developed a line of oysters that are resistant to dermo. Now, dermo is the disease that kills oysters. It doesn't have anything to do with public health. But um, it's probably one of the reasons why uh, when, when the drought that occurred in the watershed of the Apalachicola River, dermo probably in, in, uh, increased its prevalence in Apalachicola Bay. And it's one of the reasons why, just one of the reasons why there's a decimation of oyster populations there. Dharma's been around a long time, and uh, this, this picture is actually a magnified 100 times. It's a piece of oyster rectum that was cultured in special broth to allow these germo cells to enlarge, and you do that for seven days, and then you you stain it with a special stain so they're dark. And, and dermo can, can wipe out a reef. It's in high salinity, high temperatures, when an oyster is entering its second year of growth, it, it, it can decimate an oyster reef. It can kill a lot of oysters. And what we've done, my colleague Adela Shu and I, had developed a broodstock line. We call them O-Boys because the original parents came from Oyster Bayou in Cameron Parish, Louisiana. So we have a dermo-resistant line available, and what it does, it allows those oysters to survive to reach market size before they succumb to the death by dermo. So we have those available. Now our partnerships are with the Louisiana Oyster Dealers and Growers Association. Uh, they are our state trade association in Louisiana, and I've been secretary treasurer of that, of that organization since 1985. And what we've done is we've developed them. LSU has, has signed a contract with LODGA to be the uh, commercial distributor of our hatchery products. And, and you can go to this website and place an order for eyed larvae or what I call window screen spat. And those are spat that are just big enough to stay on a window screen. A window screen is basically a thousand micron hole in it, okay? It's what you put up on your windows. And I said earlier, I don't want to be in a seed business, but this is the only two hatchery products that are going to be available through Dealers and Growers Association. And these prices, are, and we have them available for just regular diploid wild oysters for our O-Boy line and for triploids. And either as eyed larvae at a cost per million or as window screen spat for a cost per thousand. Now, if, and what we're doing is we're rec in Louisiana, we're recommending nursery growers who are new in the business to use, they're going to take these eyed larvae and we'll teach them how to spat them on crushed oyster shell, microcult, sugar size stuff, or they'll just get the window screen spat through Dealers and Growers Association and raise it up, raise that spat up to seed size to be deployed into cages. And what we're recommending is, is to them is to use the same prices as the Maryland Oyster Recovery Partnership. And if you go to their website, if you're in the oyster business in Maryland and you want to buy seed from the University of Maryland's hatchery, you go to the Oyster Recovery Partnership and you buy it from them. And these are the prices they're charging for this size of seed. And that's what I'm recommending to our Louisiana nursery operators to be charging for, you know, to, for, for the seed prices. Um, and this is our new building being funded by $3 million of uh, the NERDA money. It's Natural Resource Damage Assessment of the BP oil spill. And uh, it's uh, well underway, but behind schedule. But we'll be moving into that this coming spring. And um, this is what I like to do in my off time. <laughs> Thank you. I've got a question, John. Mm -hmm. um, oysters fatten up in the winter time, right? As you were saying. No, they spat in the spring and summer. They fatten in the winter. Oysters fatten in the winter time. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm hard of hearing. Winter time. Can yeah. Can you describe what this fat is, where it comes from, how it, it's created? It's glycogen. It's glycogen. It's glycogen. And it's, and it's produced in their bodies by, from feeding on algae. So and, and other things that you know. It's based on water temperature. The colder the water temperature, it, the oyster starts storing glycogen, typically through the winter. And to give you an example, if you're in the shucking business and you're shucking oysters in the wintertime, you're, you're, you might be getting our sack of oysters in Louisiana as a bushel and a half. You're harvesting, a, you're shucking a bushel and a half of oysters. Your meat yields are somewhere around 10 or 12 pints. Come summer, by June, the oysters have spawned out. Your meat yields are four and five pints. Maybe three pints. Hmm? Maybe three pints. Maybe three pints. <laughs> That's why Willie Daisy's interested in making triploid spat on shell because he's planting it on his lease, so he wants to bump up his meat yield. Mm -hmm. Now he realizes he's going to he may get an overset of wild spat, and he has already. But when he goes to shuck that, his meat yield's still going to be higher because there's triploids mixed in there with it. Okay. 
Okay, but the glycogen is being built up from algae and from their from food the supply. Yes, yes. And yet the food supply is reduced in the winter time. You know, the, the water's cold. Depends on where you're at. Depends on where you're at. is reduced. The water gets clear. Mm -hmm. That kind. Of but come springtime, you know, it the, the 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 it depends on where you're at. That's where a riverine influence is important. If you have enough riverine influence, your water doesn't get so clear in the winter time. That's why we lead the nation in oyster production because we're near a mis we're near the largest river in the continent. Because they have all the diatrotus and the leaf litter. And well, not only just that, you know, we we have an extensive marsh system in our state. I mean, we're losing it critically, losing it, c coastal erosion. But you know, you know, we have that we have that whole estuarine marsh ecology going on there. So ours isn't so much leaf litter. Ours is ours is that marsh. Connection. Well, so, it's called the tritus that's coming in from, exactly. from uh, organics and from vegetation and that right. kind of thing. So right. whichever way it does, it's still the uh, the bacteria. But the the production of glycogen is it, uh, you don't get in the, that in the summertime because the water temperature is too high for the thing to metabolize it. It takes a certain low temperature for the animal to start to produce it. It's, uh, well, what you'll notice when you start spawning and working with oysters down here in the summertime is, is you have fat oysters and, you know, and when you start up the hatchery, say in February, March, everything's fat with glycogen, okay? And you've got to tease back the mantle tissue, which is the skin of the oyster that wraps just underneath the shell. You got to tease that back to look at the gonad to see if it's ripe. Eventually all that, that glycogen in the mantle tissue all disappears. It gets utilized to make gonad and when they spawn once or twice it gets to a point to where you can look right through the mantle tissue and see the gonad. And then through the summer if what you do is you just take those, those spent oysters and you hang them off the dock for about four weeks and leave them alone. And let, and sometimes just they'll get covered with silt if you got those kind of conditions, they'll ripen again. But they didn't go through the process of storing glycogen to do that. It's like they took every morsel of food they ate and made, made gonad, and then they let it go. And what we call their dribble spawners down here. They'll ripen and spit, ripen and spit all through the summertime. And your challenge as a hatchery manager is to know when they're spitting, when they're ready to spit. And what you can do is you can have a broodstock holding system and bring that into the hatchery where it's temperature controlled. So we don't condition oysters at our hatchery. We just let them ripen out in the wild. And when they're ripe, we bring them in and hold them under cooler conditions and then spawn them when we want to. So it's easier that way. And Tom Rossi with Four Seeds Breeding Technology out of New Jersey is here to again go over that technology as well as some of the application in other places than Louisiana. All right, Tom. So um, I think my job here is just to give you an overview of trepoid use in other parts of the world. And uh, this will be another piece of the knowledge that you'll put into your, your total base and make a decision on your own as to what you're actually going to, to use or plant if you're going to be an oyster grower. Our uh, friend here, Professor Supan, is a strong proponent of the triploids. He told you that you should be building triploids in those cages. I frankly won't go that far. I'm going to give you enough information. Well, I'll give you some information. You'll gather enough information. And you're going to have to try this on your own to make your own decision what should go in those cages. So um, I guess the first question maybe is, why New Jersey? Uh, this, the tetraploid technology in, in, for use in, in shellfish is a technology that's actually owned by Rutgers University. Uh, Rutgers uh, uh, owns the technology because the two co-inventors, Dr. Stan Allen and Schmingo, were Rutgers University professors when they uh, perfected the technology there at the Rutgers University uh, Research Lab. So um, Rutgers caused this company to be created, for these breeding technologies play on four chromosomes and four C's. And uh, we actually started uh, uh, in the commercial venture on the west coast of the US. Why the west coast? Because there they grow gigas oysters. As you know, here you have uh, the eastern oyster of Virginia. That is the uh, eastern coast of, of uh, this continent. It's about the only place where it grows, with some exceptions. The rest of the world, by and large, grows the dry gas oyster. So since we wanted to go where oyster growing was already accepted, we started on the west coast. Uh, in 1997 we actually began the first commercial trials at uh, Lee Hansen's hatchery in uh, Tillamook, Oregon. 
1997 wasn't all that long ago in the scheme of things, and certainly in the in the uh, age of uh, oyster growing. Um, and to this day, we really consider ourselves to be sort of a young piece of the industry, and maybe the whole industry is young culture. That is not obviously oyster growing. Um, to this day, there's probably less than 50,000 tetraploid oysters in the entire world post juveniles. Um, so that is, you know, you, you, mature adults. So it's a relatively small number of animals, a small amount of product to work with. Um, so as indicated, we, uh, our first uh, uh, commercial introduction was with dry gas on the West Coast. Uh, we actually had a, a researcher that worked for us at the time who went to uh, the, the West Coast to do his master, no, his PhD thesis. And he basically studied the effectiveness of triploidy in uh, the oyster plantings on the, with dry gas. And what he found is that uh, chemically produced triploids outgrew the, the local diploid seed. This is not wild seed, this is seed produced in the hatchery. But when you created triploids with tetraploids, what, a process that we call the natural triploids, the average additional meal, meat yield was about 53%. So, you know, we, uh, certainly a commercially viable method. At, at that point, we figured that, you know, it, it worked in the lab, it works in the field, so, you know, we kind of went from there. So, uh, since that time, the West Coast was uh, the largest triploid producing center in the world until disaster struck about three years ago, um, maybe four years ago. Uh, in the late uh, 2000s, there was uh, two large hatcheries on the west coast that produced oyster seed. Uh, one of them, Whiskey Creek Shellfish Hatchery, uh, Lee Hansen's hatchery, now run by his protege, produced five to six billion larvae per year. And about half of them, about 50% of that production was in triploid. Uh, the other large producer out there is Taylor Shellfish. They produce less, but they're mostly a vertically indicated company, which is kind of hard to imagine, but they're probably producing two to three billion larvae a year. With the proviso that there's uh, serious ocean water quality issues on the West Coast and their production has all been down in the past couple of years. Um, so uh, tailors produce also about 60% uh, of their production in, in triploid. So again, start thinking about this, that uh, at least in those areas, it's not, it's not the end all and be all for oyster seed plantings. Uh, you really have to know your area and you have to know what happens in, in, in your own backyard and in your own lease, you have to know what's going to be good for you. Um, just briefly, I'll tell you that we, from the west coast, we went to other large oyster producing areas of the world. First one was China because Xmingo, as you might guess, is Chinese, was born in China. And uh, we used his connections in the oyster world there to attempt to produce uh, uh, tetraploids in China. So frankly, it was a very, very difficult situation. And we never really got a strong foothold there until about three years ago when Xming himself, along with one of our partners, uh, actually took over or leased at least persons, a hatchery in China. And they have been, for the past three years, working on this process to produce trip tetraploids there. But as John pointed out, it's, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a long process. So there is some small triploid production in China. Even though China is the largest aquaculture facility or aquaculture country in the world, it has a very, very small triploid use. Uh, we've also uh, begun some projects in uh, Korea, which is a, the probably the third largest oyster producer in the world, and there's now about a half a dozen uh, uh, projects going on in Korea to produce uh, triploid oyster there. Again, this is dry gas. Uh, one area where we found a, a great success was in Australia. In Australia, most of the seed, in fact, most of the oysters really are, are grown to the south part of the country in South Australia. There's a large production in New South Wales, but really in Tasmania the smallest province in Australia. They happen to have the two largest oyster seed producers maybe in the world. Um, and they are presently producing about 200 million seed. They grow seed big over there. And about 50% of that is, uh, 
is triploid, actually a little bit less. Uh, fortunately for the, the triploid users, there was a, uh, uh, a rule made in New South Wales that triploid only seed was allowed there because they took the advantage of the, the uh, non-reproductive non aspect of the triploids and said we don't want to plant gigas in New South Wales, but because triploids are sterile and they won't reproduce, we'll allow <coughs> gigas seed to be planted if it's triploid. So for our partners in, in um, Tasmania, they had a, a, a bonus for a few years until, of course, the herpes virus struck New South Wales about two years ago. So let, the latest catastrophe uh, you know, of, of many. Um, and speaking of catastrophes, the, the, there's, uh, there should be a brief discussion of what's going on in, in uh, Europe. You know, probably the, the third largest, uh, fourth largest oyster producer in the world is France, was France. But about three years, maybe four years ago, they were hit with a uh, herpes virus that pretty much decimated their population under 18 months. All the juvenile oysters largely died, not all died, but largely died. And that has happened every year since then. So the French oyster industry is really in, uh, in serious trouble. Well, they're still growing oysters, but of course they're planting much, much more seed. Um, Specific oyster mortality syndrome sounds a little bit better. Yeah, other than the herpes virus? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, same point, though. Uh, actually, they, yeah, they call it something else in, in Tasmania. I forget what they use there. But. So they, uh, what's happened in Europe is that the, the French oyster growers are looking to Ireland to supplement their products. So they have... Uh, uh, sort of all rushed over to Ireland to plant seed. And about in 2012, 330 million seed from France was planted in uh, Ireland. Well, that's not all from France. 90% of it was from France, some a little bit from England. So of that 330 million, probably 300 million of that was triploid because they love triploids in France. The, uh, the, the product just prospers in, in their, their markets. I guess the, the, the French are... Uh, particularly uh, uh, delicate eaters, and they like the way the meat quality determines. So, uh, to the extent that uh, it, there was some uh, benefit based upon this calamity to the French oyster growers, the triploid markets in, in Ireland are pretty strong. So, um, that really brings us around to the, our, sort of our own backyard here. Uh, we didn't have tetraploids for use in the uh, eastern oyster, Virginica, until about six years ago. Uh, so, you know, because we were busy doing things in other parts of the world, we just didn't have the time and energy to, to put the effort into growing tetraploids. And again, as, as John pointed out, it's, it's a sort of a difficult process to produce tetraploids. Once you have tetraploids, it's not a difficult process to produce triploids. But the first part was difficult. So about six years ago, we had the first tetraploid crop in, uh, on the East Coast, and most of that was used in, in Virginia. And I'm going to pass out uh, a little handout that I have that will show you some of the, the uh, results of triploid use. You've seen this, John. And on the East Coast, uh, there's, in this, there's a, a, two studies that are mentioned. The first study up top is a study that was done in the Chesapeake Bay comparing triploids and, and diploids. And you could see that uh, in certain locations there was double the meat weight discovered in the oysters that were pro provided in the study. Same thing in, in New Jersey and a little bit less of the result in Massachusetts. So the growers on the East Coast within the past couple of years have found that the uh, triploid product has worked very, very well for them. Uh, in the Chesapeake Bay, uh, again, I'm going to give you 2012 numbers, there was about 2 billion oyster larvae produced for setting on shell. About 85% of that in 2012 was triploid larvae. Again, they just found that there's a, a, a 
a particularly good result with planting triploids. By the way, these are all crossed with a, a disease resistant line that was created at the Aquaculture Breeding Center in uh, Gloucester Point, Virginia at VIMS. And the combination of the two technologies has uh, allowed this bustling population of uh, spat on shell. So all that larvae was set on shell and all of the planted uh, in the Chesapeake Bay. On top of that, there was about 70 million seed also produced. Uh, and all of that is, is planted in some type of gear. And again, about in the Chesapeake Bay, about 85% of that in 2012. Uh, was triploid. You might note one thing, that percentage is actually down from the year before. The year before the percentage of triploid of the total was about 91 percent. So some of these growers have decided on their own that they can't put all of their marbles in the triploid basket, which is really the, the uh, I think the take home point that I have for you or for a, maybe for anyone that's starting out in the business and for a new industry that's beginning. You're not going to know whether the use of a triploid product is good for you until you actually get some seed in the water and you follow this growth in your own locality. Uh, again, we, we don't ask, we don't recommend anyone to put all of their investment in a triploid product. As, uh, Sue Cudd, who now runs the Whiskey Creek Shellfish Hatchery, tells me triploids tend to get the worst first. So in many cases, they really outproduce. They can be more resistant to disease. They grow up faster, get out of the water before disease hits them. There's a, a number of advantages, but not always. So we caution anyone, certainly someone that's starting out in the business, not to uh, accept uh, that a triploid product is going to guarantee success. Um, plant some sampling of different types of seed. Uh, the, you're going to have, a, ho hopefully, so, the opportunity to plant different types of diploid seed. And you know, by and large, and eventually, you're going to have a chance to, to uh, plant triploid seed here. So um, I can tell you this, that if, if this process works right, you probably won't see me, as if you're growers, you won't see me. Uh, we really deal with hatcheries. Um, I'm just here to kind of give a, an in introduction to the program, but uh, we'll work with hatcheries in the area, we'll work with hatcheries, you know, wherever the, the industry calls for it, but we don't deal directly with growers, so don't call me if you want to buy something. So, yeah. That's about all I have. I just want to remind you, at the first workshop, I gave some Results we did with Stan Allen, where it was chemically induced uh, triploids, and we had them in, Al in Apalachicola Bay 20 years ago, and the proof was in the pudding. There's a diploid all looking like some of that spent oysters that Soup just had, and there's that fat wintertime oyster harvested in the summer um, after a 12-month grow out, again, in Apalachicola Bay 20 years ago. Dwayne, you were there. I think we produced some of the seed right back here. Um, did you speak to specifically what 4C's breeding technology's role is in tetraploids? Because it, did you mention this is a patented process? Well, yeah, um, it is a patented process, but that's, you know, you, you can go on the, uh, the patent office website and look up the process, and, and if you think you can do it, go at it. Um, <laughs> we, uh, what we do is we really facilitate the, the growth of tetraploids. As John pointed out, we've been working with him for almost 10 years. Um, and you know, some of the problem has been mother nature down there, but uh, we, you know, we, uh, we work with the co-inventors of the process. We, you know, we, we develop tetraploids, but we don't generally uh, we're not in the business of, of, of selling tetraploids directly. We try to make partners with industry people, usually hatcheries. Uh, we, we, you know, we try to facilitate the use of the tetraploids in the particular locality. In Florida, we, we recognize there are certain rules here. Uh, there's, you have the issue of Atlantic Coast uh, stock versus West Coast stock. Uh, you know, we're going to have to deal with that a little bit, but uh, so what we'll do is we'll work with hatcheries in this area to to develop a system whereby you can have triploid oyster seed available. And uh, at this point, we hopefully have enough you know, uh, tetraploids available at LSU to you know to kind of get things going pretty well. I, I don't know that there's going to be a large call for seed, 
but we don't know. So we're just going to. Leslie, it just dawned on me. I didn't answer your question. Just that you asked me whether we're going to have triple oil opal. Yes, I did. And 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 I went into a tirade there. But but um, when we first started developing the triple oil line to make our tetraploids with, well, you get through up here if you would give oil. that to Bill. And in every case where we had to yeah. use right sperm from yeah. a diploid male in that process, they were opal. Now we have seen triploids grow in our farm there, seven years old, huge thing that we were rearing just for our broodstock line development. And so there are strong indications that we have indeed developed a triploid ovary line. But we don't have enough data on there to start making claims of it. But we, we see a lot of indication that we have. But there's a lot of screwy things going on between those chromosomes. And so, and so we've got a brand new graduate student going to be coming in and just left Stan Allen's lab. He's going to be working on all those details. So we can't honestly claim that. Okay. Did you answer your question now? <laughs> so we're going to stop. Thank you, John. Thank you, Tom. Um, five minute break is all you get for smoke a cigarette, coffee, water in the back. Then what you're going to do is go out around this porch area here, and in the garden area will be the various gear types and Bill Walton. Bill is going to lead the discussion on. These considerations we mentioned earlier, so what I want you to do is kind of stand around the porch so we all can hear. Five minutes we start. This hour is to kind of talk about, again, the type of gear and some of the various considerations. We're not going to talk by brand, per se, but we have people here that can interject. John, again, this is Bill Walton from Alabama, Auburn University Shellfish Lab. And I had this in the back of my truck for some reason, and both these guys said, what did you bring this? So this is ancient history. This was the three-tiered rack that we developed in Apalachicola Bay when we were able to extend beyond six inches. We had that statute removed to limit the six inches. It was actually in law. And so the next, in aquatic preserves, which most leases are in aquatic preserves. So the next step was we used the height of a crab trap, 18 inches, um, to develop some sort of modular system to support the high-density polyethylene growing bag that comes in various mess sizes. They're boxed. We actually had a formulated closure here to secure those around the 5 8 inch rebar, and then we long-lined them. And we developed our boat system so that you could run along this and with a big boom winch pull these up. Um, they're great for growing sea squirts. <laughs> oh my gosh, we can grow the heck out of sea squirts. I just don't know where you sell them. And that's part of the issue. These were on the, off the bottom, but on the bottom, <laughs> subtitle conditions here in Florida. And fouling, if you did not keep up with this on a bi-weekly basis, you couldn't even pull it into the boat, right, Dwayne? Oh, yeah. Yep. The other issue is we tried to utilize the space so that this wasn't a single tier. Well, if you're in high salinity areas, guess who's sitting down here? That's stone crab. That's a perfect perch for a stone crab. And all he's doing all day long is taking that claw and the bag above it, pull, pull. You should see some of the bags we used to have that a stone crab could pull on this, this type of uh, plastic and pull it down until it could enter in. So, lessons learned. Um, again, these type of rebar frames done singularly support a lot of the oyster culture operations in the Northeast where they have intertidal conditions and they call it rack on bag, bag on rack. Yeah, yeah and they're a right. single layer. So, um, so there's the history. Now let's move on to Bill. All right, can you all hear me? Yes. All right, definitely informal. This is about as fancy as I get. So I've asked anyone here who has ideas about how to say it better, please do. But that also means ask questions. All right. I wanted Leslie to start with this because the rack and bag style is one of the methods that we tried. We, we used a cage, but same idea. You have the oyster sitting on the bottom. And that was one of the methods we tried. I wanted to show you another method that we tried that we weren't happy with. 
my problem with this gear, whether it's a cage or a rack, like Leslie said, it's always sitting on the bottom. And the only way that I get those oysters and this gear clean is I'm, I'm spending labor. Now it's either me or I'm paying somebody, and it's hard labor to get that up out of the water. And now I gotta clean it. And so I, last time I was here, I mentioned that Chris Nelson at Bon Secor Fisheries, uh, spurred on by Leslie uh, and, and taking some of those ideas over to Alabama back in the 90s, that he called it a biological success, but an economic failure because his oysters and his gear were always in the water unless somebody that he was paying pulled them out of the water and power washed them. And so his family finally pulled the plug because they said, you're, you're growing beautiful oysters, but we're spending way too much to grow those beautiful oysters. So. That's one method. Again, we tried it over in Alabama just to put it in there and sure enough, they uh, get really cruddy. And uh, the oysters are actually stunted a little bit. We had that because the predators are bothering them. So we didn't like that one. This is another method. This is very popular because this is one of your cheapest ways to get into oyster aquaculture, a typical floating bag system. Guys love this. You'd get a string of these bags. Um, you'd have a line that runs along uh, the water anchored, and then you'd tether this to that line somehow. And your oysters are right at the surface, so they're bouncing around and that looks good. I mean, they're right in the where food should be. They're bouncing. And the beauty of keeping your bag clean is I walk out one day a week, I walk out and I just go down my line and I flip my baskets over like this. And what I've done is I've taken the green cruddy side that has a week's worth of fouling on it and I've put it up to the sun. So just by walking down the line, I, I flip it once and I've, I've done my fouling control on the bottom of the bag because the bottom is now the top. So why don't I like this? I don't like this because what's always in the water if I do that? The oysters are always in the water. So I can keep my bag clean, they will still get the flow, but everything that I don't want on my oysters is in that bag. The, you guys, I've seen oysters over here with the sponge in it, the mud blisters, the overset, barnacles. The only way I get those oysters clean is now <laughs> I got my boat and I have to unhook these from the line. I got to lug these into the boat. I've got to take those oysters on shore and I'm going to power wash them. I'm going to air dry them. Whatever I'm going to do, I'm back to, I am have to manually move my oysters off the site to do that. And there are a lot of things you can do. You can do brine dips, you can do freshwater dips, air drying, power washing. Uh, every, every time you touch that right. oyster, it costs money. Now, by the way, in other parts of the country, you, that might be worth it because you might have to do that once during the life cycle of the oyster before you go to market. But uh, the story for me in the Gulf is uh, I've got to do that every, if I got to do that every month or every, whatever it is, it's just not worth it. So we, we did not focus on this um, despite some of the interest in this. So, yeah. When you air, you talk about air drying oysters, can yeah. you just take that? on a tethered line and keep it out of the water for a certain amount of time, air dry the oyster? Like no. crank it up? Yeah, yeah, keep it up. I'd have to think about how to do that, but yeah, you could. And I'll show you how that Australian long line system is sort of, auto, like not automated it, but formalized that. But yeah, you could probably do something like that. Um, while I'm talking about things I don't like, I don't like floats like this. This is, uh, um, and I'm sorry if anybody here sells these, um, but I don't like I don't like floats that fall apart. All right, I mean I, yes, these are cheaper, but these are going to fall apart. Uh, and uh, from personal experience, um, you don't want the environmental effects of that, and frankly, you don't want to have to spend the money to buy another one of these floats. And yes, I have used pool noodles on um, but bags, and they will float oysters, but again, they'll just fall apart. So. I know everybody wants to get in for as little money as possible, but whether it's the gear or overcrowding oysters, uh, you lose if you try to cheat the system by going cheap on how you do that. Like that, the oysters will catch up with you if you do that. This is another thing I'm not crazy about. So this is a sort of a modification of that type of bag. It's a sealed bag. So that looks nice. I've saved a lot of labor. I buy this bag and it comes with one end already closed. I get a, like PVC is pretty cheap and you just have to watch your eyes when you do that with the, with the power saw because pieces will fly. Uh, but you know, this is how you close up your oysters. Um, now you can imagine this is pretty clean. You can imagine with a lot of sponge on this, this could get harder. So rubber mallets are sometimes involved to get that open. But I don't think you like these either. Do you, right? What I don't like about this is 
there is no space in there for my oysters. And you get all sorts of corners where uh, you get your oysters stuck in these corners. I just don't like that. I know it's very popular, a lot of people like this, but um, I feel like this way I end up with winners and losers in my bag of oysters. I'm going to have guys stuck in the corner over here that are going to be misshapen and smaller. It's just not giving me the motion uh, that I like on it. So. You can't move around in there. They're going to grow through that mesh. The, yeah, they'll eventually grow right into the mesh. Jack, can I grab this up? Sure. Okay. So we prefer what we call a boxed up bag like this. And somebody asked me already, I'm glad they did because I probably, you don't buy it like this. I mean, probably you could. Somebody will do this for you. But typically, you're going to buy this. This is going to be shipped flat. And it's going to be cut to the length of three, or three feet or so. And how do you square this up? It does have a natural seam um, that they have on the plastic there. Um, but we built, I couldn't fit the jig in my Toyota Corolla, um, so, uh, but I, I think we could put pictures of that. I'm sure we've got pictures on, on the Facebook page. We have a jig, it's two pieces of two by four that come up. You drop the flat plastic over that and that will square it up for you along the seam. And then you have razors uh, attached to the wood, screwed into the wood so that when you push it down, you make flaps right here. You pull the bag off, flip it over, you push it down again, and on this side you make those flaps, you fold it over and you hog ring it, and you get a beautiful squared up bag. The advantage of this now is, and there are a hundred ways to close a bag like this, the lazy man's way, which I'm guilty of, is we do three cable ties across this. I don't recommend that. You'll spend more money on cable ties than you want. Um, you'll drop cable ties in the ocean. It's just not the way to do it. Often you'll get a little bit of bungee cord and uh, hog ring it here, hog ring it here, and have a hook that just comes over and closes this. But boy, man, I love this bag because when I have 150 or 200 oysters in here and I move this bag, you're going to hear those oysters move against each other. There's lots of room. Like, they're not going to get stuck in the corners of these. So this is like a really nice way. Go ahead, go ahead. I have one comment. I like to add one more cable tie right here and mm -hmm. catching this edge here. Because when you're flipping cages and you're rolling your seat around, if that edge, that we, what we found is that edge can, it can, can it trap can, some oysters yeah. in here. So, so, so that edge right here, I'll add, I'll add one, two, three, and you, and when you add them, you're going to, you're going to do it so you catch all three pieces right. here, all right here, so you make a nice firm corner, but I like to add one more right here so that edge of that mesh doesn't, yep. doesn't fall prey to, or the oysters fall prey to the mesh, so. But I'll tell you, I, I've gone to a lot of electrical supply companies and bought bags and bags of cable ties, and I think um, from an efficiency point of view, like at Auburn, it's it's still uh, at the level of a couple acres worth of stuff that we're trying to produce. That maybe is worth it. But if I was running a farm trying to do a million, like a half million oysters, um, I would have something that's a lot easier than cable ties. Absolutely. Yeah. If you're stainless gonna... steel clips. Hmm? Stainless steel clips. Uh, Absolutely. If you're going to be opening up that, that bag again and again and again, yeah, you need a quick opening method like a shock cord and a hook. But if you're gonna, if you, if that's your grow out bag, and you're gonna put your 150, 200 seed in there and close it up until their market size, and never open it again till harvest, then you can close it up with cable ties because you, you know, it's done. So there are other. This is a stainless steel hook that you can get. Um, when I was in Massachusetts in Cape Cod Bay, I, I cursed these things because on a December morning on low tide at five in the morning, um, cold hands made these really hard to get off. Um, but yeah, you can run this through and you can, uh, but again, you know, you always got to get the thread. See, I, I'm not crazy about anything where I have to spend time getting it right. So I've always been a fan of the bungee with the hook. Just, it's so simple. You get it right every time. That's, so are there companies that make these things already assembled with all the stuff? And typically, stuff? no. And again, it's because I think a lot of, I don't know. It may is be it, coming. It may be coming. It may be coming. It may be coming. This is honestly, this is the type of thing. My experience has been that most people want to invest as little money as possible and then pay like a local high school kid money to build these mm -hmm. over the winter. That they feel that they'll, that's typically how they Plus there's shifts. Like, right. They do know, ship more yeah, effectively. If you box, yep. there goes your shipping cost. Yeah. Yeah. That's just, yeah. You don't want to pay for shipping air. Yeah. yeah. Um, They're pre-cut and shipped. Pre-cut in. Reinforcing ribs. Okay. Are they? No, this one does. This one doesn't. This yeah. one might have. You might see it on this one. Yeah, you know, that's exactly. a good point. You don't want to pay for shipping air. Okay. So you know, it, there might be an advantage to having them shipped to the area flat. 
then you get some well yeah. ended up they come in bundles of yeah, 20 or 25. Marine, local marine hardware store we have ams or something might be able to uh, supposed to be here they, they make up crab traps and that kind yeah. of thing so right. maybe let me come back to the bags that, that that's useful for a lot of things did you uh, but let, let's start with an australian long line system because like i said i, I wanted to show you these are options. I don't think these are options. I know these are options I don't recommend. I don't think John recommends these either based on his experience. So the two types of gear, again, not going with brand names here, the two types of gear are either a floating cage that you can flip and sink or an Australian long line system. And so that's developed in Canada and this is developed in Australia. Um, I do tend to recommend my advice at home to folks is I buy gear, my, if I'm starting a farm, I buy gear that somebody else has grown and raised and harvested oysters from commercially before I decide I can do it cheaper and better myself. Because I've seen people make their own gear and it is always the month before harvest that that gear finally gives way and sags in the middle and all the stuff ends up on the bottom. Like I, I just, it's been my experience. And so I would recommend buy something that works. If you think you have a better idea, do a pilot project of 10 or 20 of them next to your stuff and see how they do. That's just my personal advice on that. So there are two main companies and so one main uh and if i'm forgetting one i'm i apologize but the companies i'm aware of are um uh, uh, bst and sepa and uh sepa makes different mesh sizes these, these are some ones with that they left here what they share in common is these baskets are going to hang in some fashion on lines that are strung and typically that would be a piling and the way we would uh, you can do these any length but we would have a piling and we've used eight inch pilings and the guy from SEPA told us they could be about half that or less but uh, we put in pilings um, and we put them a hundred uh, hundred yards apart and then we stretch a line called BACO which is this monofilament type line here um, and, uh, and then we put this thing called a dripper tube on it. We stretch that between those, and I'm not kidding you, we take out 6% of the length, we crank this out, we take about 6% of the length out, and that line, I mean, you could play music on that line, it is that tight, um, but it doesn't break um, when, by pulling it. 6%, it will be tight. You pull that tight, and we would do two of those next to each other, and by next to each other, I think about, well, about a basket about yeah about a basket length apart all right so you'd have two imagine down here that we have two pilings down there and two pilings 100 yards away with these lines strung tight between them and those lines are probably going to be around what i would call like midwater is where you would attach them at the posts do cross line or in line so there are two options to do and that's right is cross line or in line so in line means that on that line you'd have a series of these bags or baskets i call them would um you'd put them on that line you'd turn this and these baskets are in line and you could put in a hundred yards on two lines you'll get 200 of these baskets in all what right what do those baskets cost i know that came from australia or whatever, but, uh... about 15 dollars but, but let me remind you also, we have the various equipment suppliers have provided us with brochures and size yep. that you can directly contact them for price. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the, these would hang there. That, what is good about this? All right, well, one, in line, it's supposed to be able to do this. All right, your oysters are rocking back and forth. So as they're in the water, as you get some wind and wave action, you get the rocking. Why do you want the rocking? Because you don't want oysters stuck in corners. So this is ideally going to help shape them up, break off edges. So that's one advantage of this system. The adjustable part of the long line system, I said that line, I'm tie tying it into those pilings at mid-water. Every 10 feet, 9 feet, you have something like this. Now you can make these posts out of a lot of different things. I have this one because it's broken. I think we had we buy 10 footers of these. And you put clips in. And these clips are the adjustable one, two, three, four, I'm missing one, one, one's come off. This is. It's UV resistant. Um, it gives us a sturdier pole. And you could jet these in, but I the, our bottom uh, would be too soft for that. So we pound these in. Um, you pound this in so that the middle clip. Oh, sorry, the middle, I'm supposed to have five clips here. One, two, three, four, there's one, a clip here. This clip would be where that line wants to rest naturally, all right? 
And then you can adjust it. On, um, if you have winter tides that are, are drying out and you need to keep your oysters in the water, you can drop that line down. If you have a hurricane coming, you drop it down to the bottom line and you're securing it as close to the bottom as possible is, is what we've, we've done. You had decent success with that with, with, with Katrina. We had this system deployed. You saw a picture of it. We had that system deployed in, in our old location when Katrina hit, and uh, we lost very few bags. Now, granted, we had a rock breakwater right near us that took a lot of that, a lot of that current, but we had very good survival. What you would typically do, though, I mean, so we would, the way we have done this is uh, for six days out of the week, I'm keeping that basket at a level that is just below the surface of the water. So they're in that top layer of water, they're getting that wave action, they're rocking around. And on the sixth day, I go out and I lift that basket, that line, each, I lift the line up and I can decide how high I want to go up depending on where the tide's going to be that day. And then I walk away and I come back 24 hours later and then drop it back down in. So I'm giving it 24 hours of air exposure to let the basket and the oysters dry out. Um, so I had an oyster tonger come down and he watched us do this. He likes that looks like a lot of work. Um, oyster tonging is a lot of work too. That what we wanted to get away from here was I don't want to handle each oyster. I don't want to handle each basket. So if I have the benefit of if I can just go down the line and clip these up, then I'm getting I'm moving a lot of oysters and a lot of baskets by doing that. The cross line version is a little different. Um, and by the way, they make these in different mesh sizes. So you can imagine, John was talking about what size seed you get. So you can put your smaller seed in this, and then as they get bigger, you can move to this larger mesh size, right? So when you harvest that final mesh mm -hmm. basket, how many are in there? Sorry, right. Um, gosh, we, we started at 75. I think that's what John's work showed was an ideal density. Uh, then we have now done some work between between the densities you tried and so under a hundred but like about 90 is the most you can get in here before you start to crowd them that's we stock at 150 so uh, 75 and 150 are the two different stocking densities that we recommend now you may find that you can cheat on those you may find you can put more in but um i wouldn't go i know in canada they think 225 in a bag and i just but they have slower growth in canada they do so you got, like, what is that, about a two and a half foot length on that? Yeah, something like that. Can you get it longer? Can, uh, longer? Not from this company. This company does make a bigger bag, a bigger basket that you can get. Before I go into that, I'll just show you the cross line configuration is, remember we had those two lines going across here of this monofilament line that has this, this is what a, this is what a hundred yards of that looks like ready to go. So that, I don't know what the line costs. I'm sorry. That stuff we haven't uh, doesn't doesn't wear out. The only way we've had it break is if we put. Remember, it's supposed to be 75 oysters in here. Uh, I have been guilty of having 300 oysters in here, where the top is starting to pop off because the oysters are growing out of this. This is that's this bag is easy, 50 pounds at that point. Um, and if you have 250 pound bags along that line, those lines will eventually snap for you. Well, can I jump in here on our question? Um, Last is a relative term. Uh, if you do it right, we've had lines last 13 years so far and they're still going strong. If you make them too slack, and what happens is your oysters get heavy as they grow, and, if you, and the ideal thing to do is to set those up so they're pruning in that wave action. What will happen, that'll also make that long line bounce up and down, and right at that clip, that line's doing this, and it'll rub it raw and cut it in half. So you gotta be very careful on how you set this up. They can last a very long time, or they'll last a very short time if you do if you do it wrongly. So. That's true. Um, yeah, and that is again, we have to be careful about skimping a little bit. Like you want to get the system right because if you get it right, it should last. Um, the cross line. So imagine those two lines that we had going across. The inline, it would be like this, and would have hooks, and it's doing this. Well. You can also take your baskets and do this. And if you want to get as many oysters in that 100 yard run as possible, this configuration lets you get 50% more oysters in. You can get 300 bags in that same distance as the inline configuration. What do you trade for that? I think too much, in my opinion. So these hooks would clip onto that line like this, and then this would hook in. 
My basket's not rocking anymore. I've got no motion on that. It's just suspended there. Also, going from six bags um, between posts to nine bags between a post, um, when I, that job that I mentioned of going down the line and uh, walking down your lease or boating down your lease and lifting that, if you've put 50% more gear and oysters on that line, that line is a lot heavier. So um, here's the other thing that happens. <clears throat> it's not just heavier. I'm no longer a one-man operation. All right. If I'm cross line, um, John. If John. If if I'm on the other. If John's working with me, um, I I need John to work with me because if we're clipped in here and I walk down, if I try to do this and hook this up here, not only am I fighting the weight of the line going this way and that way, I'm now also fighting this attachment on the other side. And, and I'm not kidding you, so you start doing, if you're doing it alone, you do baby steps of, you clip it up one clip, then you walk all the way around, you clip up the other one, one clip, you walk all around, that's, I don't got that kind of time. Um, so, so it's a two man, if you go in line, it's two man, so you are more space efficient, but I would argue, um, you're not getting the pruning, and you're not as labor efficient. Remember, Do you run your lines with the current or against the current? Yeah. <laughs> I want my primary wind and wave action to hit me this way. Exactly. Okay, so I'll do it that way. Um, because Take I home message: with pr pruning is important. Yeah. And the idea is, is that you don't want to have to actively go out there and prune. You want to, you want as much. Uh, you want the pruning to occur naturally, either through the other things you're doing to your system or letting your wave action do it. The value of the, 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 the greater advantage to the Australian longline system over the floating cage is that you have a little more farm management involved, where, where you can see you're going to have a choppy day based on your fetch, and you can set this up particularly to let those let them get pruned in that wave action and then you can lower it back down later or raise it back up higher depending on you want or if you want to if you want to kind of Rayal mentioned this uh, earlier this week you, up in Canada they don't want to slow their growth down because it takes three years to reach market size we'll get very fast growth down here and you can you can raise some of your lines up to be exposed at low tide every day depending on your tidal cycle whereas some of your other parts of your farm you can have your your lines underwater all the time and just air dry them once a week and you can slow that down and separate that growth out by three months so you could stagger some of your farm that gets harvested three months later than the other part of the farm that gets harvested 12 months the other would get harvested in say 15. so that gives you more farm management options all right and how is it maintaining it from a boat? Um, I've seen videos in Australia that there are plenty of people who do it. We have not, we have not done that um, because I've broken a rib or two uh, leaning over and pull, trying to pull stuff, not these, but trying to pull stuff up over the side of a boat and crack the floating rib here, whatever that is. And I, I don't, I, but it's, people do it, um, but I haven't figured it out yet. There is a platform that's demonstrated at, at oystergrow.com that, that where they hang the platform over the gunnel of a boat and they step down in it and now they're waist deep water with the gunnel right here in their back and that makes flipping their cage better leverage, okay? Or pushing it down and flipping it better leverage. You could take that same technology and use that on a long line system. You just gotta get in the water and get your work even with you. But you gotta pay attention to how you deploy your, your poles because that gunnel, that, that cage is going to be, you, you're going to have these poles in your way here, and you're going to be, might, you might be pushing yourself away from the work all the time. Yeah. And what you don't want to do is have that gunnel busting those clips off. Yeah, so so, so you're going to want to turn all your yeah. clips on the inside. So if your boat rubs on the pole, it's on the bare side, not on the clip side. On to the, I don't know what time I've got left. I should move on to the next system. But I want to mention, John mentioned pruning. So you want to be broadside to the wind and wave. But it's not just for pruning. It's also because you paid for this basket, this whole basket you paid for. You do not want all your oysters in that basket growing down here, all right, because they're competing with each other. You paid for this basket. Take advantage of the long side of that so that you're getting as many oysters are seeing fresh water with uh, new water with lots of food hitting them. All right, that, that's just part of that. The, the other system is a, a different shape bag. Um, by the way, they, this is, they were visiting. They obviously make larger mesh. This was 
an experiment. They were asked by one of the hatcheries in uh, Australia to do stainless steel for their real small seed. But imagine that the stainless steel isn't there and you can see what the mesh bag looks like, right? That's the large mesh, all right? Um, but they like the same type of, you know, you've got a clip that you can pop this open and, and dump these out. These are slightly smaller. They would probably only put about 60 oysters in these, but the company will tell you that you can fit more of these on a line. So they would argue that they are more space efficient. I'll, I'll let you all figure out if that's true or not. I, uh, I don't know. These also would have hooks. There are different ways to connect these. Now, are those plastic openings durable plastic? Yeah, actually, I haven't had the, um, the things that will break are things that rub or like clips will break. All right, that, that's the type of thing that'll break. Those clips will break. But I haven't had the baskets break. I haven't had these things break. Um, but it's the thinner, like where you have that thinner plastic, that will get a, that you'll see those break sometimes. And of course, you can replace those. And but the only time I've seen them break is in the wintertime when it's cold out. Yeah. Because the plastic gets a little more rigid. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, overall, actually, the biggest problem we'll have is if you don't tend your baskets and it starts to get fouled up here, when you go to open this, the barnacles will then make it hard to close again. Right, and you can clean those off, but that's also a sign to me that I haven't been tending my stuff enough. So what's an estimated lifetime uh, on them? I'll tell you, the suppliers, I think, say something like eight years in our business plans. We've said five years, just to figure something more conservative than that. And I've got that system in the water long. I think we're one of the first deployments in America, albeit small, for research purposes. We've had it in the water now for 13 years. But... Figure you're going to at least have to pressure wash that once a year. One of these companies, um, I think it was SEPA, SEPA, has now gone with a steel cable. So instead of this um, monofilament, they take a steel cable now. And I actually think this is kind of neat. They slide a spool onto that. So they pull that between their pilings. Um, and of, of course, you're not going to stretch steel cable. Um, so what they do is that spool fits on here. And then you have a ratchet. And it winds around that spool. And you take up the, lot, the excess line that way. Um, and I kind of like that. I think I might, I might get that. Um, the other thing, that, this is kind of a neat innovation. Wherever you hook into your line, of course, you're going to get rubbing. Um, so one thing that this other company's done is they've got these little, these clasp on, they've got little teeth inside there. So you clasp this on so that your hook for your basket just goes right on there. So your baskets won't move up and down your line um, and they won't rub on that. They're, they're on plastic on plastic. So I kind of like, that's kind of a neat innovation. Um, I should mention, where do you use this? These companies will, will tell you that you could put all these baskets on floating lines. You could do something like this and you could float this gear. Um, I don't have any experience with that. My experience is with this is with a rigid line, with some type of pilings, with, this stretch, with a line stretched tight. So I'll, I'll focus on that. Because of that, you need a place you can put pilings. You need, um, and you need a uh, bottom that will obviously hold these so it can't be really, really soft mud. Um, and especially if you're gonna walk it, every week. You need something that's not going to swallow you up. And then remember, you also probably are in a depth of no, probably between four and I think six feet is about as much as I'd go. Because for me to get those oysters dry, I have to lift that line above my head. And I'll tell you <laughs> that this clip, when this, when this is up here, depending on your height, like I have found significant, I, I don't think it's just muscle differences in our lab. The guys who have a few more inches height find that a lot easier to get to that upper clip. It's just, you get to that awkward height above the water and that would limit how far you could put this up. So this is a great system. I've put some pictures up there for people who want to look at it. This is very, very popular in Australia. Go over the water depth requirements, minimum, maximum. Minimum, maximum. I don't think I'd put this in less than four feet of water, and I, don't, I wouldn't put it more, more than six feet. Now, of course, you can have some tides that go above that, but on average, you want to be in that range. Um, and, uh, and I also would avoid the temptation of, uh, I think, I impose an artificial low tide on these to control my fouling. So whether it's once a week, Every two weeks, you have to figure out what that is for you. We do it once a week. We take these and they get out of the water and they are well and truly dry for 24 hours, unless it's 95 degrees and we don't do that. We do it overnight. 
you could try to play the game of making these intertidal oysters. Everybody know what intertidal means? exposed at low tide naturally. So you could say, all right, if I set my baskets here on a high tide, they'll be underwater on low tide. Every day they'll be exposed. The reason I don't like that is I've had a farm in the intertidal zone and I got a lot of fouling in the intertidal zone. I got barnacles, I got oysters, like some of the things that are my worst fouling organisms I would still get. It will control sponges and the soft bodied stuff, but that hard bodied stuff, which is the worst to get off your oysters, loves the intertidal zone. Well, 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 hold that pipe up right there. Yes, sir. Take a look at that pipe. And take a look at the fouling marks on that, the, 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 muscles, the barnacle scars and the, and, the, and the stain from the algae on that pipe. If you got a site in mind, the first thing you want to do is go out and stick a white PVC pipe and let it foul. And, and it will tell you where, you where you need to farm these oysters. 24 hours to kill the barnacles and, and the oysters are it, fine. If if you're religious about it and are doing that before you can even see the barnacles. I, my mantra with biofouling is by the time you've seen the problem, it's, it's too late. Like you've made yourself work. Like what we do is, what, like I don't like this idea of when I see a barnacle set, that's when I'll go do it. Because you're going you're gonna to be too late. And so then to kill those barnacles, you're going to have to go longer and that could kill your oysters. But we have found 24 hours under 95 degrees that, that we have no, no death of the oysters and that kills all the newly set fragile stuff. Couldn't you right. use your clip system if you had a long, a long dock and just tip that to the pilings and connect yep. it that way? Yeah, we've got people who modify their dock systems, yeah. yeah. So let me go on to, because uh, I don't know, what, what time are we at? Wait, time to go. Okay. <laughs> time. So this is um, the generic here. Uh, uh, this, is, this is an oyster grow, but uh, the generic is, this is a floating cage. All right, this will float up at the surface. All right, but what's, but if it just floats at the surface, then I still don't control fouling. So let's stock this. I don't have four bags worth, but you could see uh, in this cage, and this is the mini version. Uh, th this is also made with, this is a four pack. This is also made with a six pack where you can have two more shelves in here. So I put my Vexar bags in here, each with, let's say 150 oysters. So this unit would hold 600 oysters, all right? You load these up. Put me to work. <laughs> Unfortunately, not squared up. But you can see, slide those in. All right. Thank you. Here's the water level. It's floating right here. Um, a buddy and I at the shellfish hatchery at Auburn, we got both of us on here, and we couldn't sink these. I mean, this is a lot of flotation. How much flotation? A lot. Uh, a lot. <laughs> All right. We had to be. We had to be. We had to be pushing 400 pounds of guy on top of this that couldn't hold it underwater. Um, so we would load this up six days out of the week. It's floating there. The oysters are right below the surface. On the on that sixth day, we go out and let's see. Let me close this up so I don't dump my bags. Sixth day, you go out and you flip your cage over so it lands up, it's floating up on the pontoons. And you are so far above the water now, these bags are gonna not, they're gonna stay dry, they're gonna dry out. Um, and, and in fact, uh, you can see that even this bag is a little more shaded, so these will dry out more. But over 24 hours, we've found that that effectively controls fouling on both these. Now, I will tell you, somebody asked about dying oysters. So this system, we'd use that long line system in 24 hours under any conditions, we'd never had a problem. We did it with this system for 24 hours because that's when we had the guys down there to do that. And that's when we found that 95 or so was our limit for this because the oysters on these top shelves are not getting any splash at all. Those maybe get a little splash now and then. These were dry and that's good. You could, but, but what we do instead is if it's 95, we just flip them up overnight and flip them back because I want that drying, all right? Our, okay. our, our recommendation on our data was you flip them over, start flipping them over in late afternoon, in the summertime, in the heat of the heat of the day. Flip them over, start flipping them over by 4 o'clock in the afternoon, let them dry all night long, and then get them flipped back over by 10 o'clock the next day and just skip that heat of the day. But overnight drying is effective. Yeah. So what does this look like? So, um, so you've got these. on the After 24 hours, we just flip it back, and the flipping back is the fun part. You're going to use some muscle. And... It, it's not so much the weight, it's the bulk. And you can, you can learn how to do that. And yes, you can do that from a boat. In fact, in Canada, it's entirely done from boats because it's Canada and the water's freezing. Um, but um, you can work this in from 
uh, we work these in five foot of water, five, four to six foot of water as well with no problem and flip them that way. But you can also flip these from a boat. Um, let's see. So you flip it back. Watch your bottom type. You know, you don't, if you're going to be pushing on stuff and you're, you're in, in, you're in some muddy conditions, your feet are going to sink instead of your basket go up. All right. So you're going to want hard bottom if you're going to be working this walking around. And I will say, you know, one of the reasons they made a smaller version and both companies that make these do make a four pack. If uh, a lot of the farms in Canada have crews and so flipping a six pack is doable by a couple people over the side of a boat with the type of rig that, that John described where you're in the water um, and flipping it. But um, if you're in the water, uh, if you're only one person, I can flip this cage even loaded with oysters. I do have uh, some tricks where I'll step on the cage and, and flip it over, but um, you can do this with one person. It's easier with two, but you can do this size with one person. Um, I'm going to tell you right now, we have put 200 oysters in each of these bags, and I'm I'm glad to say that our oysters grow fast here, um, but they also grow a heavy shell. So unlike other aquacultured oysters I've seen in Massachusetts, I mean, aquacultured oysters that get to market, you can almost see through. I mean, you hold it up and they're really light shelled. Our oysters are not light shelled. I mean, they're lighter than a reef oyster because they're not as old, but they are, they're not wimps either. There's a significant amount of shell weight in this. And so when we have put 200 in each of these bags, we have had problems. It just becomes very bulky to flip this over. All right. Um, I should point out that uh, these floats actually, this was one model. The floats are now being pushed out further so that this has got a more stable base so that it doesn't fold back. Okay, so this floats, it flips, and then it also sinks. And this is important. So the flipping lets me air dry. The sinking is good. In Canada, you worry about sea ice. In Alabama, we worry about hurricanes. So. We have, we got clipped by, I forget which one it was. Um, we ended up not getting hit by it, but you, you'd flip this up and you can take these caps off on both ends and this will sink to the bottom and you can walk it down and this will sit on the bottom, um, keeping them hopefully out of the mud um, during the storm. And you're hoping that the tide surge comes in like it does with the Australian long line system and that your wind wave action is up here. All right. What keeps the cage there? All right. That's the long line system. Um, How do you empty it afterwards? You're flooded, you're filled. Oh, sorry. That's a good point. How do you get it back up? Right. Because it is. So how do you refloat? So um, there is a rig which I have yet to build on one of our skiffs. Like, and this would fit on a typical Carolina skiff, where you've got a culling board with ramps down the side, and so you would be able to grab these. And I'll show you. You grab the line, you pull the line up to the boat, you attach it to a star wheel, you bring this cage up, and it rides up the ramp over the side of your onto the culling board. As it's coming up the ramp, it's draining. It gets up on your culling board. If you need to rinse it out, you can rinse out mud out of these. Then you recap, and then you just put it over the other side, and it floats again. And then you go down to the next cage. Um, before I get to this, um, before I tell you the line, for spacing, now imagine, remember that 100-yard run that we had for Australian long lines? And you'd put 200 bags in that. I would put 30 of, these, of this size cage on that same run. Um, or 20 of the six packs. It works out that on this system, that comes out to 18,000 oysters on that run. With the Australian long line system, if you do the inline, 75 times 200 is 15,000 oysters can fit in that. If you go cross line, uh, it's 15, it's like 22 or 23,000. So, it, there, it's in the ballpark. It depends how space limited you feel. Um, but so what do you do? So this was the commercial uh, line that we had made up for us by uh, a company that sent this to us. All right. And so you'd have the, let's see, where's the tail? Okay. You'd have an anchor and I would go with a bigger anchor than this. All right. But that would be the anchor that the line would be attached to. It would stream out and, and uh, since I'll never untangle this, um, it would come out all the way to another anchor, which would be about 150, 160 feet apart. So I'd actually have, in that 100 yard run, I'd have two of these lines, all right? We're Point. using anchors that are hot dip galvanized, six inch auger, six feet tall, and you can buy them from electrical supply companies that, are, that, are, that use them to tension the power poles that you commonly see. We're trailer companies. Yeah. And then... Yeah, but the trailer companies aren't hot dips. 
So, right. So, what holds the key? So that's your line. This is where I spend my money. I spend my money on those anchors and this line, and I make darn sure that there's no chafing there. Like, I'm not. We wouldn't do it that way. Like, you want this no chafing because this is what when that storm comes through, when that current comes through, this line is what's going to hold your cages there. And the way it does it is you have lateral lines that come off your main line that would come up to. And I'm I'm sorry, I only realized at at. Uh, two o'clock when I came out here, I realized these didn't have um, the bridles on it, which is just a, like, a, you could use quarter inch poly DAC, something like that, three eighths. Three eighths. And you just put a loop here, a loop here, and it's got a little uh, slip knot here that you open up, you put this washer through it, you close that knot on it, and this acts as a, as a swivel for it, all right? And so you'd have a pair of these, one would be here, and one would be here. And so your main line's on the bottom, and it doesn't have to be like zinging tight along the bottom. It just has, you know, it, it's, the tighter it is, that'll allow you to um, keep your cages in a tighter line, but you don't want it too tight. Um, but this would then be a series of these cages going down that line, all right? And you can flip these back and forth. It does have the advantage that if you have a problem with the cage, you can just undo the slip knot. That's very easy. Take this off and you can bring the cage in. So, um, so this is what we bought initially. As we spent money on these cages, I was like, man, I, I don't know. We wanted a little more heft to it. So this is a, probably 160, 170 foot of half inch polydac line that we would use now. And so we lay out our lines. We lay it out. You can see, I don't know if you can see the yellow paint on here. We spray the distances for where we want our cages to be. All right, where we want our lateral lines to be. And you can see, so then, and anybody who's done any network, it's much easier to thread these on if you get this line taut. Like I'd spool it out, attach this. It's harder to do it when it's soft like that. And what we would do is take a, uh, we use lead line like Real said, you can use much cheaper line than this. This is what I was able to get for my class at the time. And I, it's not even clear to me, you just need sinking line more than you need lead line. Um, you open up the strand, you run this through, and then there's, let's see, it's called a rolling half hitch, if I remember correctly. And I'll never remember it right here, but... Um, <laughs> no, and, and then we actually found this stuff is hard to tie, so we would just use a very large uh, hog ring there. What this does is, the, we do not want these lateral lines moving. I want these lateral lines to stay put. So you'd, you'd put these on, and then you'd put that rubber stopper that we have on here, and then your line is made up. And we'd re-spool this carefully. The way we do that is we loop, our, uh, we loop our paired lateral lines. We just give it a little knot around this. And then we spool everything up on our spool. And we go out to our site. Um, and we get ready to put in our anchors, all right? These are baby anchors. Do not use these anchors. These fit in my car, okay? <laughs> um, but again, like John said, I wouldn't skimp on the anchors. Like, get something good. Um, but what do you do for the anchor? So I've got my spool out there. We screw in an anchor and I, I'm five foot, six foot. Double helix is nice if you can get it. Um, screw this in and you will tie one end of your line to this. You spool it out. When you get to the other end, you're not going to actually tie that to your anchor. All right, because then you have no adjustability. You get to the end. Can you just put a bowline in that? John? What I do for my second anchor is I tie a tether line to this, and it could be 10 feet, 20 feet, whatever you can fit in. And when I get John, we would come together, and I'd pull his, his end of the line to me. You know, whenever you tie a knot in these things, you always want to open the bite and throw the yeah. tail through it so it helps lock it up, you know. You probably already know that, though. Okay. Thank you. I did not know that. <laughs> okay. And now what I would do is, with my adjustment line, I'd circle this through this and get that as tight as I can and then I put another bow in. And what that does is now I've got a nice snug main line going across the bottom. So my cages are going to look nice and pretty in a line. All my lanes are wide. Why do I want this? Because when I want to bring those cages up on board over my culling board and get them up on, uh, I don't want to have to fight this being tied down to the bottom. So the first thing I do is I go to this side. I pull this up to the surface so it's nice if you've got enough line to do that, right? You pull this up to the surface, you open it up and you tie back here. 
And now you've given yourself whatever you've got, 10 foot of slack to that line, and now you can go work that line and sink your cages, bring them on board, whatever you want to do. There are specific spacing required, and I consider them requirements, not recommendations, on how far apart you put your, tie your lateral lines to your bottom long line, okay? And, and you should follow them because pruning is important. That's lesson number one. Chafing is bad, okay? And when you're working with rope and it's out there floating in the water and it's moving around with the tides, you got to eliminate chafing as much as possible because the last thing you want doing is this stuff break loose and float all over the damn place. All right. So, so there are there are rec there are there are, there are requirements for how you space all this out on your line, and you need to follow them. Okay. Don't try to don't try to save a couple of feet of rope. Right. Yeah. And Just you to confirm you only do 150 foot uh, length runs on this. You wouldn't do a 160. Okay. The, like the cages are of course less than that but the more that you give yourself on the tails you'll find that the easier it is to work because if you put that anchor too close to your first lateral line you're going to find that that wants to pull everything down right that wants to pull that cage down and you'll find when you try to flip that cage that's closest to the anchor it's trying to pull it down so there are spacing recommendations even between the first anchor and the first cage okay you want to follow those and, and again, and, and the reason because it works where it's done commercially, just do it, okay? Just do it the way they do it because it works. Now, I mean, Don't try are, to save rope. Right. There are some things like they put more length on their lines, uh, I think in Canada, right. on their anchors because um, you don't want to go in the water to have to find that knot, right? So it's got to be enough slack in that line that you can bring that up to the boat and do that with your dry gloves on, right? So, so that's the only other thing I had to get to but compare these was... Let me just make a head count. Is Kurt Himmel here? Did he show up? There was a chance he may not show up. So if Kurt's not here, he's not going to give a 10, 15 minute talk. Okay. Um, and Kent so. hasn't shown up either. And Kent hasn't showed up. Uh, have you heard from Kent? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Well, uh, really what I want, we talk about bottom type and water depth, because John has pointed out that let your sight help you choose your gear. That's the first consideration is your sight. What, what gear is appropriate to your sight? But then you also have to make decisions about logistically what appeals to you, like what, like the handling and how that works. But for, for sight, I will say that I've, what I've liked about this system for me compared to that system, not using brands, is that this wouldn't be shallower than four feet, all right, but you can go to a lot of depths with this because because um, I'm not worried about posts I, if I'm working it from the boat. So you could suddenly be in 12 foot of water. You can be, certainly you can be over six feet. Um, so you could be in 12 foot of water with this. And I don't care what the bottom type is like anymore because I'm not walking it. I'm not putting posts into it. All I need is enough bottom that I can grab anchors into. And there are a lot of solutions to anchors. Uh, cement block. I mean, there are a lot of ways to do that. So um, this to me opens up because in Mobile Bay, we have a lot of muddy bottom, a lot of really muddy bottom. So this opens up more sites for us when we can do this. But watch your fetch. Okay. A long fetch, deep water makes a taller roller. Okay. And it comes in there and it can, you know, it can do some, it can do its job. So deeper water is fine, but you got to watch your fetch too. Other thing, I want to come back to bags. So remember, you don't have to use just one type of gear. I've got one grower who uses that for grow out. He likes that system. Um, he's shorter than me, so this system looks like about the right size to him. All right, this is, this is a nice handleable size. And I will say, my wife and I used a system like this because she's five foot one, and it's easier for her to handle this bag than it is one of those bags. I mean, this was one of the reasons we chose it. But um, you do have to buy different mesh sizes to handle different seed, or you have to buy inserts to, to handle smaller stuff. Um, one of the things that you can do with this system, and that's what my grower does, he grows out in this, but he uses this system for nursery stuff because this framework will hold different size bags. So you can put, this is, is that the one millimeter? That's pretty small. Yeah, the smaller All right, one, and then, uh, and we'll put like 10,000 oyster seed in that. And after two weeks of growing in this, this thing is pretty badly fouled, but all those oysters are big enough to go into this. So I just dump them into here. I split them in half. This goes from 10,000 to 5,000 in this. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, they'll, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. 
don't care. Yeah. I hate them. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want them. Yeah. I'd rather leave seed in a shoreside nursery and let it get big enough to go into a larger mesh. I'm so fast here. Yep. It almost bypass all. No, and I agree, but you do get options of changing out bags from the gear here. The other thing you can do is, uh, this was a great revelation when we went to New Brunswick. John and I went up. Uh, on the side of your skiff, you have two little pins so that when you come up to your cage, you rest this, you pull up next to the cage, you rest the cage on the pins, and because that's attached to the main line that holds you there, you flip open the doors, you get your bags out, you bring those into the boat, you replace them, whatever you want to do, you unhook and you go on to the next one. I mean, it's a... Yeah. It, it, I had my local welder in Grand Isle make me an aluminum bracket that slips on the gunnel on my boat and has two thumbs sticking up, and it's spaced so that when I grab that, that cage and pick it up, I can hang it right on the gunnel of the boat. I don't have to bring the whole cage out of the water to pull the bags in and out. It just hangs there on the boat. And then you close it up, you, you close the door and hook your, hook your, hook your bungee hooks in, you just lift up and throw it in the water. It's very simple. Yeah. And then when you're not using it, you can put it in a shed and stick it on your boat later. In that, in that system, there, yeah. you said you, you stock about 200 per bag? I actually stock 150. And how many on, on, on the final bag? On the final grow out density. Final grow out bag. Yeah. And on your farmed oysters, how many oysters to a uh, bushel? We don't sell, all right. So we don't sell them by the bushel, I sell them by the piece. But do you have an average on what you get you don't for 60 sell, pounds? You don't want to sell these oysters. Got to sell them by the piece. Yeah, I was just wondering how many were in a 60 pound. So a uh, 60 pound roughly, of course that varies, you know, could be up to 250 for a typical average. 250? 250. Well, can I, but, can but, I uh, say something yeah. also? And it's really going to depend on, you know, you may have someone that wants to buy a larger oyster. Yes. Or you may have somebody that wants to buy a, a, small. a smaller oyster, depending on half shell yeah. or shucking. So it's going to vary with the size yeah. of what, you know, how long you need to grow it out. I mean, right. say you want a four inch oyster. So you're so naturally going to have less there, the larger size of the oyster. So far, my experience has been that. Um, Nobody's trying to, nobody's successfully growing these and with the intent of selling them to a shucker because you just can't get enough money for it. You just can't. Um, so they're trying to sell it as a half shell. And so typically that's, uh, you don't have to be three inches in, in Alabama, you can, because it's a private lease. So if you have a market for two and three quarter oyster, you can sell that. Let me ask something. Now, what is the law here, Leslie, on cultivation? Market dictates it. As long as you are on an aquaculture lease and you're certified through the division, the market dictates so the harvest size. So you're not under size. FWC size no, as, as far as the... What I'm teaching our guys is you want to shuck these oysters, you make spat on shell, you throw it on the bottom, let it grow, and you dredge it up, okay? Just like you always did over there, okay? You want half shells, you go this way. But you don't want to sell them by volume. You're going to screw yourself. You want to sell them by the count, whether it's a 100-count box, whether it's a 100-count sack, it's by the count because they grow fast, they have a thinner shell, and what's going to happen is you're going to be growing meat, not shell. So you're going to want to, if, if you fill up a volume measure, to give you an example, a Louisiana uh, sack measure is a wire basket. It is certified in the Department of Ag, and everybody's going to use that size. And when they're, when they're going through their catch from their dredges, and they're calling in the oysters, and they're filling up that basket, and it's level, you go in there and you count it. On the average, it's going to be about 200 oysters. We did that with cage cultured oysters and long line cultured oysters. It was 300 oysters. Okay, same measure. And what you're essentially going to do, your buyers give them 100 oysters for free. You don't want to do that. All right. You want to sell them by the count. Well, can I also say something yeah. else, too? Is, is, um, the thing about marketability is that, I mean, I've worked half shell bars. I managed a restaurant on Panama City Beach for about seven years. Uh -huh. And, I mean, you may buy a bushel of oysters and get 12 dozen, or you may right. buy another bushel and get right. 24, I mean, right. you know, right. a dozen. But the thing is, is marketing your aquaculture product is you're going to guarantee this guy. 100, hey, right, 100 count you know, box. Look, so you know, I'm going to give you 120. Yeah. I'm going to give you 10 dollars every, every time, time you buy a box. Right. And these Open guys, the whenever, box and yeah, stop. so when they do the, all their, uh, it's already clean. Uh, you know, when they do their, adjust their food costs, there's no guesswork. Right, for them. right. And I will say, so Mobile, I mean, is, is not New Orleans when it comes to food. And so when I got there, people said, look, you're never going to sell fancy oysters here. Because the mantra in Mobile is uh, as many oysters as possible for as little much, as money as possible. And that's what the consumer wants to pay. And, uh, 
And so that's not the market. You need a place where they've got a, a raw bar menu where they have, what we started doing is we went to the fancy uh, yuppie restaurants in Houston and Birmingham that already were getting East Coast and West Coast oysters. So Birmingham, Alabama has, they're paying somebody on the East Coast and the West Coast for their farmed oyster. And so they have customers that are paying 225 an oyster so I know they have customers that will pay that price. Let's give them something that is of equal or better quality from here. And now the grower, of course, doesn't get that. All right, you know, the grower does not get that. But um, that's the restaurant trade that you're trying to break into. And that is not necessarily in the coastal towns that we live in. That's not, I mean, most of us get our seafood locally and we don't think of that, but you start getting into the bigger cities and there are the restaurants that want that and, and it isn't volume. It's, it's price and it's quality. So this will increase your survival, but you must also increase the quality of what you're producing. If you're producing a crummy oyster, then you're gonna lose money on this. You gotta produce a, and I saw some beautiful oysters today. Like, like it can be done. Like, it, um, you can grow a very pretty oyster here. I mean, stuff. Um, I hate to get back <laughs> in, but um, I know now the boat price to the harvesters yep. in Apalachicola Bay is between 42 and 45 dollars. For a sack? 60, 60 pound bag. How many oysters do you think are in that? Uh, you're looking at probably about two, 200. All right. I so, 200, 200 all right. It, yep. it, all right. And I mean, it varies, like I said, but I mean, right. you go between 150. Better than it was. I know that starts to get it to the, the high price. Yeah. That's the highest price right. Ever paid so I have told all the guys in Alabama that we've look. Do not link your price to supply and demand. I know right now everyone's looking at how few oysters there are and want to ride that wave. You are priced, if you grow your oyster this way, your price is dictated by what it costs you to produce that. That has nothing to do with whether they're harvesting oysters in Galveston Bay or not. It has nothing to do with it. Your price is your, is your production costs. And, you know, I think the range of 35 to 50 cents an oyster, so yes, a 100 count box is gonna cost you, uh, is gonna cost the wholesaler 50 bucks, let's say. And then he's going to sell that for 65 or 70. And then it's going to turn into a restaurant, and that's going to have to be sold somewhere for a buck 50 an oyster to make that work. That's not, that's not our little spots along the coast. Um, but there are places like that. I got one question. Yeah. Birds. Birds. I love birds. birds. <laughs> All right. Um, so, birds, yeah. You shoot them? Uh, we don't, um, you know, there are. The birds love, they don't love the lines so much. They do love the pilings. So we have very pretty pictures of pelicans sitting on pilings at each end. And the loser pelican is sitting on this one on one foot. You know, you got the, the four winner pe pelicans and then the, the guy who lost out is trying to balance on this. Um, so we don't see them on the line so much. Um, on that stuff, you will see them on the floats. They definitely use the floats. Now there are devices, you've got something, it's a tickler that uh, it adds on to it. Yeah. Call it uh, birds be gone or uh, anti carmo yeah. yeah. the yeah. yeah, we got we plenty of carmorons. Yeah. We got the laziest birds in Louisiana sitting on my stuff. Because when you put this in the water, it's going to attract bait fish, shrimp, and 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 it's going to make great fishing around them too. Okay, which can be a problem when you start working this stuff and there's a mirror lure broken up and you're hanging there and get you in the hand. You know, you're never going to have to buy a fishing tackle again all right but but you're also you know your birds are going to be hanging around there too and they're going to be sitting on your gear and just feeding on the baits that's hanging around this stuff so they get real lazy so do they cause their problem or is it i don't think so nuisance i don't think so we you know we it's just more how it looks we haven't seen a problem with it um you know, I'd like to claim habitat value. I mean, we're you know. <laughs> telling how, how, how it fits with nature. All right, so I have about 10 apples. I know we could probably sit out here till the mosquitoes drive us away, <laughs> but we need to move on. We have some other presentations. Um, we're going to go back inside the auditorium. Again, get your coffee or your. Uh, I spoke briefly at the last workshop about. Um, BMPs, so everybody that has a lease and that's harvesting uh, for commercial use has an aquaculture certificate, um, and you guys have to follow the best management practices. So in the back, there's just a quick uh, one page, two sides. The one side is genetic selection, and the back side is disease selection. 
So they're in the back, so you don't have to read through the whole BMP manual to find this section that speaks specifically to those. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them again because we talked about them last time, um, but one of the concerns was about triploid oysters. Um, so just briefly to talk about that, um, if you are getting triploid oysters, this is for grow out in Gulf of Mexico. Um, your seed has to be, if it's derived from tetraploid oysters, um, crossed with a diploid, it has to come from Gulf of Mexico stock. If it's triploids derived from uh, diploids, you know, heat shock or chemical shock, those have to come from Florida Gulf of Mexico waters, Gulf of Mexico stock. Okay? Um, if you guys have questions about the BMPs, I can speak more about them if you want me to, um, but I figured everything's back there. Um, one of the other things we're looking at is uh, one of the questions during the last session was how long is a health certificate good for? Um, you know, the health certificate is only good for the lot that you had tested, and you know, it's, that lot doesn't go back in with the rest of your stock. It stays separate, you know, pending shipping and having a clear health certificate. So we were thinking like 30 days you know, from the time that you have the testing done until you ship it out. Um, and these aren't in the current BMPs. That's just something that we're, we're looking at when we do our revisions. Um, I think that's it, unless anybody has any questions and you want me to talk about specific BMPs. Do you have a, do you have a hand on I put flyers in the back. Oh, very good. So you could put this on. If you have tetraploids, yep. If he's using tetraploids to derive the triploids, you can purchase from Gulf of Mexico stock. Yes, Steve. Um, he's sell, you're selling tetraploid sperm, correct? We will be. We can't put seeds. <coughs> we can buy that. Can we fertilize that with our diploid eggs? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, you would still want to do a health screen to make sure they're clear. And it still has to be from Gulf stock. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's our preferred. Right. Okay. It's the simplest thing. Um, <coughs> less work on our part, right. and uh, you get what you're after. And we're going to be shipping it to you in these little one and a half milliliter plastic vials, all, right. all chilled and ready to go. You can rinse it out in a little beaker and look at them on their scope and make sure they're accurate. Do you include the glove? Pour it on your eggs. <laughs> Pour it on your eggs. Not breathing, just a little bit. So, okay. can I just briefly? Yeah. So those are not premium quality. That was stuff that they had available. So that to me is substandard for farmed oysters, but to give you an idea of what, an idea of what we're trying to do. So, but you also see from the size, that's nice meat inside there, but there's, you, you take quite a few of those to fill the bushel. How you doing? My name is Tom McGrudden, and I've been uh, a hatchery for 18, 18 years or so here in Florida, primarily with the uh, clams, but uh, we've been doing oysters for about the last six or seven years, I or oysters for the last six or seven years. Um, and I was talking with Tom uh, during the break about, you know, after the last meeting, everybody, oh, I went, I went to triploids. We don't know how to grow them here yet. It's a lot of money to, you know, grow these triploids and. Uh, I think the first thing we've got is we've got to figure out how to grow these oysters here first and, and, and we're getting there. I mean, some of the farmers that we've been working with are starting to have some success and, uh, you know, things like that. But uh, down the road, yeah, I, I, think, I think there's enough hatcheries here in the state that we can definitely get the triploids when we're ready and uh, uh, be able to start producing oyster seeds. So I don't think getting seeds is going to be a problem. I think the first problem we have to overcome is, is growing the product. So. That's a good, good point because because of the claim industry, we have the seed infrastructure. They are available. Where a lot of states go on your list, they have to develop their hatcheries first. So, so yep, here. yep. So that's all I've got. Hi, everybody. Uh, I want to thank uh, Leslie and whoever else uh, worked with her to get this organized and for this invitation. Um, you guys really have unusual problems like uh, growth, uh, too much growth, uh, hurricanes, water's too warm. Uh, we certainly don't have those problems back home, but we do have problems, uh, other types of problems uh, that were quite a challenge. And uh, so a while back we de developed the Oyster Grow system 
what we call the simplified and cost-efficient solutions to oyster farming. Uh, it was developed by necessity. Uh, I mean, uh, oysters back home was not an industry. Uh, if you had a good back, a strong back, you could probably rake some oysters, but that was it. But you were not going to be making money. And, you know, we started out with the rakes a long time ago. Uh, then the, uh, what they call the rack and bag, floating bags, and then finally the oyster grow system. Um, who participated in the development of the oyster grow system? I'd like to say that I was smart enough to sit in my office and do that. It, it, it didn't happen that way. Uh, if nothing else, I was smart enough to sit with oyster growers and listen to them what the problems were. And um, they knew, they knew what, how come they were not making money. They also had a good knowledge of the conditions in which they carried the work. They had a common sense approach to oyster growing, to oyster farming. They were looking for a homemade solution to a regional problem. Uh, quite often, uh, we had stuff coming out of France, you know, different methods and other parts of the world that people would try, but it would fail miserably because of the conditions that we had. Um, and they also wanted a decent return on their investment and labor. And uh, the whole idea of developing the oyster grow system, this is a business. Growing oysters is a business, unless you, you, know, you want to make a hobby out of it and have a few hundred oysters. But our approach was this is a business, we're going to treat it like one, and uh, this is how we're going to do it. And what we did, we started out with what are the problems? And one of them was labor cost. Labor cost was way too high. Uh, we wanted to increase growth rate and a high quality product. Back home, if you try to grow an oyster on the seabed, it's going to take seven years to grow a three inch oyster. And if you put 10 oysters on the seabed, in seven years, probably half are dead. Maybe one is, you know, of, of high quality. The rest is just a commercial uh, oyster, and there's absolutely no value for commercial oysters back home. Nobody does shucking back home. We wanted a strong and durable system. Uh, the system that you saw outside will last, I'd say, 15 years. The wire is 8-gauge wire, and the float will will last that long too. Uh, we want to reduce the mortality rate. We want to control secondary spat and fouling. Secondary spat uh, back home is a problem. We have mussels. And mussels, unfortunately, if they stick to something and they grow, they don't have to grow all that much, you won't be able to kill them anymore. Uh, so, and we all, the fact that we get ice, we, had, we needed a system where we could sink the cages or get the oysters on the bottom as fast as possible. Uh, and I put here uh, hurricane conditions. We don't have hurricanes, but we do have windstorms. And a system on which an individual could bid, build a prof profitable business. And that's where it all started. We started, uh, in, and I can tell you uh, that the first oyster grow didn't necessarily look exactly the same as it does today. What you saw outside is a four bagger. We also have a six bagger. Um, and back home, uh, I'd say 95% of what we sell are six baggers. Um, we went from zero to about 12 years now. We have a grower that has 5,000 large cages. He's got 10 million oysters growing. We have, we have set up over 150 farms. A lot of the farms have, I'd say, at least 2 million oysters in the water. Nobody has failed. Has everybody succeeded to the same level? Not necessarily but nobody has failed and it's turning out to be a job creator 
Uh, our area, if you would drive down our road, uh, it's a rural area. I mean, I come from Baktouche. John has been to Baktouche. We don't even have a street light on Main Street. That's how small it is. Uh, so it, it's a small rural community, but it, it has created this, you know, this industry has created a lot of jobs over the years. Okay. So we're using the example of what will probably happen over in Grand Isle, where we'll put 150 small oysters spat into each Vexar bags. Now back home, uh, we have to split them three times. The first time we'll put 1,500, then we'll go with 500, and then we'll go to 225. Density in the bags is very important. And you will have to play with that a little bit. Um, because if the density is too high, it's going to affect the quality of your oyster. Maybe it's growth, but certainly it's quality. If the density is too low, it could have the same effect because they're bouncing around all the time in, in your bags. So don't look at the oyster grow cage if you ever buy any and say, uh, I'm going to put 300. I'm, you know, I'm going to double the numbers, and this is, it, you know, you'll shoot yourself in the foot, no doubt about it. So then if we, uh, I'm just going to try to go down just a little bit here. Um, and by the way, this exercise, if I change any of the numbers on top here, it's going to change everything else. So if... Uh, we started out with 150 uh, mini grow cages here, uh, year one and year two. This is the number of oysters that you should get because um, if you do the math, this is gonna come down as the number of oysters that you should probably sell. Now, we, I didn't put the factor mortality in there. Uh, it got a bit com complicated, so, whoa. So I, I didn't dare, um, but if you sat down with, uh, with John Supan or, uh, or Bill or uh, even Leslie, uh, they, you, know, you can go through the numbers and you can change all these numbers any way you want. And I think that if I look here, I put a spat price here of three cents a piece, market price 40 cents, if you're borrowing money, I'd put down 6%. Vexar bags, again, I, I'm just throwing numbers here, and you could work, you know, if you were working with this uh, program, you could change just about everything. Um, Vexar bags at $4, and uh, this thing's popping up. I'm going to try to get rid of it. Yeah. Okay. And uh, oyster grow unit at uh, 110 now, this is another exercise with the large unit because the large unit has six bags. So it changes all the numbers, but for this particular exercise, we're going to keep it down to the uh, small unit, okay? Um, okay, oh, it's big again. Um, Oh, there we go. Okay, this is the second page where we see what kind of numbers we're playing with. If you were to deploy 150 units in year one, 150 units year two, this number of XR bags that you would need, this is the number of spat that you would have to buy. Now, something else that I should say, if you were to grab me by the arm on my way out and say, I want to buy 1,000 units, I would probably tell you no, uh, for the simple reason that I think that if you start out with a new system and you start out with too many units, you're going to run into trouble. Um, I have a document that I can supply that, you know, everything that uh, Bill said outside, and he did a ter terrific job on, on everything, but I have it all on paper and describing how you tie the ropes and the lengths of the ropes and everything else. Uh, my philosophy has always been that if uh, you succeed, I'll succeed. Uh, but the last thing I want to do 
is sell you a great big number of, of cages, and chances are, uh, you know, there, there's going to be a learning curve. Uh, there's also some fine tuning, you know, and, and this will depend on on your uh, environment. This will depend on the equipment that you use. There's a lot of little factors that'll come into play. This is the, the money that you would be investing um, for this. And then I'll go, I won't go through all, you know, in here, and here, if you were working with this system and you have to be true to yourself, you know, how much my expenses here, how much is, will my overhead be, repairs and maintenance, uh, communications, and you can add more lines and see, okay, does this make sense? Do I want to invest in something like this? And finally, the bottom line, which we're all interested in. With this particular model, if your ducks are all in a row, everything goes smooth, you could be making 23,000 year one, 37, 35, and 32. And here it seems to be going down again. It's uh, depreciation that's going up. Um, this is, uh, I guess it's a tool that you can work with. And uh, something else that I like to say, um, Oyster Grow is a registered trademark. We called it Oyster Grow and not Miracle Grow. And it'll work probably with every system that you saw outside. It won't, this won't do miracles. If you are not serious about doing the work in a timely fashion, whether it's this system or any other system, I doubt it that it'll work. But um, back home, I mean, it takes three years to grow an oyster. Here it'll take, what, 12, 14 months, 15 months. You've got that advantage. You've got the hurricanes. You've got other issues. Uh, and you've got all the government uh, policies, and we have them too. Uh, so, but I, I, I've seen this work uh, over and over again. Uh, if I had any suggestions was to smart, uh, start on a smaller scale, once you've taken the bugs out and you've fine-tuned everything, then you can grow and uh, you should succeed very well. Yes? So this is a 12-month turnover? Yeah, this is a 12-month, but it could be changed very easily to 15 months. Uh, at one point, I just had to say, okay, this is the parameters I'm going to work with. Uh, but everything in there can be changed to adapt to your particular situation. How quickly you want to grow. Uh, you know, year one, you, it could be 50 cages, and year two, maybe a, a 100 cages. See, down home, it, it's different because the fact that if you start with 100 cages year one, year two, you have to buy 300 cages more because you're going to be splitting the material inside the first cages, and you have to buy spat again to get you know, to keep the ball rolling. But most of the guys now are, you know, year eight, nine, ten. Something that did help a lot the development of the oyster grow industry, I must admit, was that the fact that the oyster growers could borrow money interest free. Uh, they had to put in 20%, but, and it, it, it was a loan, it wasn't a grant. And, um, even though that most government uh, officials thought that it, you know, they were throwing money out the door, they would never get it back, they got most of it back. And the, the way that it was set up is that they would start reimbursing year four so that they would get a crop year three, get a certain cash flow, and then move on. So. But I'll tell you, I, I mean, Supan was down, uh, Bill was down. Um, they've got the new warehouses, they've got the new half-ton trucks, they've got the big Kubota tractors. Uh, they're happy customers. They come into the office and 
They've got a great big smile. They're making money. They're hiring people. They're relatives. You know, it's creating good economic development on a small rural community instead of going out west working on the uh, pipeline. That's about it. That's my... Uh, yes, John? Don't let the mushrooms drive you crazy. <laughs> okay? It's a guy. All right? They're unproven until you get a year under your belt. Peace. And, the, and when you go to Bakush Bay, and you talk to everyone who will talk to you, no one will talk to you. That's the most of them speak French. <laughs> um, everyone tells you to start small. So if you haven't handled this oyster growth system before, it's real important that you start small. Get your hands wet with it for a year, okay? If you're into business planning, plan it that way, okay? And, and you can, Bill and I and Leslie, we haven't talked to Leslie yet, but I'm sure she'll want a copy of this. We'll be happy, you know, we can, well, you're in Florida, someone will be happy to sit down with you with this. But we're not going to hand this out to you to use at home. And the reason why, because the numbers will, will, will you, you'll start getting real if they die, we'll start in one quarter, lots of cages, and you're going to get it over your head. So we're not going to get it to you. But that will help you sit down and, and, and look at it to see if this is for you. But you want to start small, and I can't repeat that enough. I totally agree, and I remember the quote. It's oyster grow, not miracle grow. There will be work to be done and uh, bills to be paid, but if, if you do it right, it, it can work. Yes, sir? I may have been out of the room, but I had a question. What's the average size lease y'all are, are y'all are farming on? Uh, it varies from, I would say, 10 to 50 acres. Um, and, and something else is that basically nobody can get a new lease now because government has decided that only 10% of the total water surface in a bay can be used for aqua farming. So whatever leases that have gone out, there's none coming back. Now, I'll, I'll tell you something quite interesting about that, is 12 years ago, I could have bought 1,000 acres for $100 an acre. Now, it would cost me at least $3,500 an acre to get a lease with oysters. Yes, uh, Bill? Uh, how many of these per acre will it? How many will an acre hold? Do you think uh, the large six bagger uh, will hold at least a hundred units, between a hundred and hundred and twenty-five units. And we have a diagram of how they should be set up so that you can go around and, and work on them. Is that on your website, Leon? No, it's not on the website. But I have liter literature in the back. Uh, if somebody wants my business card. You just email me, and I'll make sure that you get all the information. I'll support you technically as much as I can if you're interested. I just point out, uh, if you go to the smaller size, it scales, it scales perfectly. So you'll still get the same number of oysters. So you're not making a decision about how many oysters you'll farm per acre with the cage, cage size. You're, uh, you'll still get the same number yeah. per acre. So on yeah. that run that I was describing, yeah, or an acre, if you don't get, if you get 106 packs, you get 154 packs. Is your cost per unit the same? From it is four it to six? pretty much scales. It's about, yeah. It's about two thirds. The mini is about two thirds of, of that one. I don't yeah. have a competitor like the other company. I don't know how they're no. And uh, to, to have about 2 million oysters, if I look back home, uh, that would be about a three-man crew for about, uh, well, see, we, get, we still have ice till about the middle of April, but as soon as the ice is gone, we bring them up to the surface, and they start feeding, and by the end of October, middle of November at the very latest, they got to be on the seabed, and it can be done with a three-man operation with the right equipment. Something else is that uh, most of the guys started out with a Carolina skiff, uh, some had their lobster boats, 40-foot lobster boat, handling these cages. Don't go out spending big money on vessels first. You, you know, buy the equipment, whatever you choose that's going to bring money in, 
and then move up. That's that's my. Uh, I'm not a you know a real hard salesman on, on my material. I know that it can work. It, I mean, we've we've got material all over North America and even in Europe. It's working, but again, uh, it's working because people take a business approach to it. My name is Kent Ferguson. I'm with Go Deep International, and uh, we started the company in 1997. And basically, how the company started is uh, a recognition that the industry at that time was using styrofoam buoys for the muscle industry, and uh, we thought there was a more environmental solution that had a lot more benefits than just using polystyrene. So we started molding plastic buoys, and uh, really where that came from is my personal history is in plastics. I've worked for a company called Dyna. And a bell, which was explosives, chemicals, and plastics. From there, I worked for a small company building uh, salmon cages, and then we start. Then I started Go Deep International, and uh, we've sort of built a team around uh, around that company. I, I sort of consider myself the least qualified person with our company because I have a lot of really good experts that work with me. Anyhow, it was incorporated in 1997. Uh, the company split in two divisions: uh, aids to navigation and shellfish aquaculture equipment. Some of our oyster farming equipment, I'm going to focus on that. We have patents in uh, mussel farming equipment and a big part of our business was uh, uh, catapulted by the mussel industry. Um, we were specialists in plastics, as I mentioned before, plastic buoys uh, and also uh, plastic netting uh, for growing mussels, but also we've uh, uh, partnered with a company in North America to develop our own oyster bags as opposed to importing bags from uh, Canada. So importing our bags from Canada, importing bags from Europe. So where we started with the oyster industry was roughly 15 years ago when we started working with two individuals uh, that had the idea that if they lifted the oysters off the bottom and floated them, it may speed up their growth because in Canada our growth rate was somewhere from seven to ten years to market size oysters. So these two people that worked for the Department of Fisheries and Oceans, Department of Fisheries and Aquaculture at the time and I worked together to develop uh, this bag you see right here which is a floating bag that is set up in long lines and uh, that uh, what we found in Canada not only did it uh, increase the growth cycle, basically cutting it from seven years to three and a half years to market size, and uh, we're in a completely different uh, climate than what you have here, but also the shape of the oysters. It, it drastically incre increased the quality of the oysters. That was another surprise. So all the oysters coming out of that bag were all choice oysters uh, with proper grading and stocking densities. It made a huge difference in the quality of the oysters. and. Uh, Basically, that was uh, attributed to the water, but also the choppiness, how the oysters, they're basically chafing themselves to give themselves good deep cups. Um, again, I'm not a biologist or a uh, fisheries expert or even a farmer. We are an equipment manufacturer. That's what we do. So we've developed different floats uh, to address the oyster industry, and we've partnered with other companies to build cages. Um, we have some evolving ideas, and it would have been great if there was more growers here to have input on that, uh, because uh, we, we have 50 liter floats for four bag cages, uh, smaller floats for single bag floating units. We have double bag floating units. Um, a number of different types of bags that can float and uh, sink as well and be resurfaced uh, for different applications. What we found with our experience is that no one system works everywhere. Every bay is unique, every bay has its different characteristics. Some are rougher, more exposed, some are deeper, some are not. So we've sort of had to work to understand where our technical expertise can be applied to work with the growers to make their uh, operation viable. And I'll just go, so this is a basic uh, float uh, visual comparison, different types of floats that we've made for the oyster industry. Uh, one is for the, uh, the uh, six bag system, one's for the four bag system, one's for a double bag system, one's for a single bag system. 
Uh, this is uh, a, just a quick example. I think people have seen this. What happened was uh, growers came to us. There were six bag systems being used. They found them as individuals, uh, very expensive to handle because they had to invest in infrastructure on the boat to handle these large six bag systems. Uh, they also thought that uh, when these were being freighted around, uh, that there was a lot of cost to the freighting air. So we uh, worked with a company called Brooks Trap Mill. Uh, that we still work with this, to this day to develop a collapsible system so that you can basically ship these in flat packs at 50 per unit to any region and then the grower can assemble them on site, put them in the water, keeping all the costs down with the four bag units. Uh, the component that we're responsible for is the, of course, the float and the bags that go inside the unit. This is sort of where our thinking has evolved and we've been doing some tests on this in the Chesapeake Bay and we've also been doing tests in Canada uh, because we've been looking at the wire cages that have been done to date and we've looked at some limitations around them which are, uh, uh, well, they're heavy, they're awkward to handle, they rust and their, their robustness is not so great. So we had to find, we, we've been looking for another solution and how this evolved was actually a grower that had an aluminum fabricator in PEI came up to me and said, um, that had an aluminum fabricator build the cage for him, say to me, Kent, can you build this aluminum cage but in plastic? And when I got looking at it and looking at everything, all the advantages of using aluminum for these cages versus using PVC coated wire, uh, and our team looked at it, we thought, there's no use making this out of plastic. You've got it. This is, this is the solution of the future. And the reason why we say that is, um, the, the aluminum uh, cages can be fabricated, as I drove through here uh, on my way from Orlando, I saw there was a number of different steel shops and different fabricators. So this can be done, uh, we have the jig information, so this, what this can do is create another economy right in your region of people that can build their own custom made aluminum cages. Uh, we're happy to give the designs for the cage. We're happy, you know, it's not our business. We, we, don't, we don't deal in PVC coated wire. Uh, we don't, we're not manufacturers and welders of aluminum. We do use aluminum for some of our production, but we're not a uh, production company that way. We're a production company specific to plastics, producing plastic floats, that's our expertise. Now a byproduct of that is that we do have engineers on staff that we can design different things and look at different opportunities. So what we've been doing is been doing a lot of different R&D with these aluminum floats. Like I say, we have a couple in the Chesapeake Bay now um, that are being tested. We had them in uh, the northern climates of Canada that are being tested. They're getting all positive results. They're easy to handle. They don't cut you up. They don't chafe. They don't bang up the boat and uh, the fouling is much less. Plus, as you can see by the design, there's a lot less, uh, lot less uh, opportunity for fouling to attach itself to the surface, which I understand is a huge problem here in the south. Well, I know it's a huge problem here in the south. It's a huge problem everywhere, biofouling. So basically, simple formula, less surface area, less fouling. And uh, aluminum also doesn't allow fouling to attach to it that easy. So we still have some work. This is sort of a work in progress that we're doing. We've hired an, an additional uh, engineer to work with us specifically for this project and uh, to design the right uh, strength versus cost uh, structure and we're probably going to at some point set up a committee and bring in some experts from other all regions put us all in a room and sort of so we can come to the compromise of okay what's critical for the strength and design and what's critical for cost of the grower you know to be feasible again this component of the cage we don't want to be involved with. We would rather contract the drawings out, the production out to other companies. We have one company set up that can mass produce this and that could be used as the benchmark for other companies to use as their model for mass production once the final design is done. In conclusion, I guess we have lots of different uh, information that we're willing to share. I'll share this information with Paul, we can go through it, that can be distributed to everybody so they can review it because there's lots of handy information there about how to set up your, how to set up your, uh, um, you know, your long line systems for the floating bags, how to set up your long line systems for the four bag system. I'm sure Riel did a great job presenting on the six bag system and so all that information is there, we're willing to share it with you. Um, again, 
it'll probably have to be customized to your environment, like the flipping fl frequencies, when to handle the bags, when to shake the bags, and, uh, but at least you have some good templates to come, to come from. And then also we have some basic construction methodologies that uh, would be very hand handy, and that's sort of the one I was going to show you about how to square the bag and uh, rig up the bag and have it ready to go so it's easy to use. So that stuff I'll share with you, and maybe you can distribute it to everybody else. Travel back to Louisiana, so we certainly want to thank John Supan, Real, as well as Bill Walton.